Okay, we'll be starting momentarily. Sergeant Kipalite, will you begin with your opening uh, speech? Good morning. Welcome to the Committee on Small Businesses. Will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? To prevent disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics on vibrate. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. We are ready to begin. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on intro 1958 and two pre-considered intros. We are joined today by the speaker, Corey Johnson, and I thank him for his leadership in supporting local restaurants and small businesses. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by many of our colleagues, uh, Council Member Moya, Council Member um, Powers, Council Woman Rosenthal, Council Member Richards, Council Member Perkins, and I'm sure we'll be joined by many more throughout the hearing. Good morning, I am Council Member Mark John. I chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our remote hearing today on intro 1958 and two pre-considered intros. Our city restaurants are a central aspect of what makes our city so wonderful, so such a great place to thrive, raise a family and invest. They are essential to the cultural fabric of the city and they deliver a variety of global cuisines that match the city's diversity. The COVID-19 crisis presents perhaps the greatest threat to the restaurant industry in modern history. According to an August 2020 report by the city comptroller, 187,000 food service industry jobs were lost in the city through the month of June. A recent report by the Partnership for New York City classifies as an estimated 679,000 accommodation and food service jobs are vulnerable to loss, the most of any sector in this city, 58% of which come from small businesses that employ fewer than 100 employees. Over 1,280 restaurants have closed from March 10th through July 10th, and restaurants will continue to close over the coming months, especially if the COVID crisis begins to increase as the summer ends. The experiences of individual restaurant owners highlights the challenges the industry faces to remain stable throughout the pandemic. Businesses, all of June at the Nugget Spot, a restaurant on East 14th Street in Manhattan, has equal to one good Thursday before the pandemic. Havana Central's takeout and delivery business in Times Square equals about 3% of its former revenue. While restaurants are struggling to keep their doors open and continue paying their staff, third-party delivery platforms have experienced a surge in use. Uber Technologies' second quarter earnings reflected a 103% jump in delivery revenue over the previous year. For the same quarter, Grubhub, Inc., revenue rose by 41% and its number of active diners were up by 35%. Grubhub CFO Adam DeWitt committed, co commented on these numbers saying, we remain confident that focusing on restaurant supply and diner loyalty will enable us to keep growing in a sustainable and profitable manner. Restaurants across the city are closing permanently. Owners are forced to lay off their staff and storefront vacancies are increasing. We saw vacancy increases a problem prior to the pandemic. During the pandemic and after the pandemic, our commercial corridors will never be the same. At the same time, third-party platforms are booming, more sustainable and profitable off of the hard work, creativity, and survival tactics desperately employed by restaurants. I am proud of this committee's work in passing local law 51 and 52, 
which went into effect this past June. These bills are set to expire in September. However, and therefore, must be extended. I look forward to hearing from the Office of Special Enforcement on their enforcement of these laws and discussing whether third-party platforms have been complying with them. The two pre-considered intros we will be hearing today will extend the cap on fees and prohibit platforms from charging restaurants for telephone orders that did not result in a transaction during a call until restaurants can completely reopen to indoor dining at 100% capacity. I'm proud of my bills and the work of this committee and look forward to moving these pre-considered intros through the legislative process. We're also hearing intros 1958 today, which would further investigate which businesses were able to access money from the Department of Small Business Services loan and grant program. The importance of this issue came to light at our last small business hearing, where the administration revealed that only 1% of their loans went to the borough of the Bronx. With that said, I'd like to thank my chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, our legislative counsel, Stephanie Jones, our policy analyst, Noah Meixler, and financial analyst, Aliyah Ali, for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I'd like to turn it over to my dear friend, Speaker Corey Johnson, to give a statement, followed by Council Member Moya. Speaker? Thank you, uh, Chair Joe and I, for holding this really important hearing this morning. It is hard to overstate, I'm not sure we could overstate, how important restaurants are to New York City, the city we love. So much, and you outlined it, uh, Mr. Chair, so much of what makes New York special has been on hold since the beginning of COVID-19. We don't have Broadway, we don't have museums, we don't have concerts, but when grocery store shelves were empty or a little bare on certain days or you didn't feel safe going out, you could rely on your corner deli that stayed open all during the pandemic to grab a bite. When you had an anniversary or a birthday, but you couldn't go out to celebrate, or if you needed some comfort food when things were rough, you could order in from your favorite local restaurant and pick it up or have it delivered for you. When restaurants were finally allowed to open up and do outdoor dining, it didn't just help the bottom line for a lot of businesses and workers, it's been good for the emotional health of so many New Yorkers. Being outside at a restaurant again, it's a chance to feel normal in a world that is anything but normal right now. And it's clear that we are not getting help from Washington anytime soon. And the outdoor dining weather season isn't going to last forever. So New York City needs to do everything that we can to keep supporting small businesses, restaurants, food industry establishments. It's not just jobs and tax revenue it's up, that's on the line. It's also our identity as New Yorkers and as a city. Can anyone imagine Arthur Avenue or Flushing in Queens without their restaurants? Can you imagine your neighborhood, whatever it may be, without your favorite local restaurant I can't. The fabric of our neighborhoods is shaped by our local restaurants and small businesses. Back in May, as the chair said, the council passed legislation to help restaurants by capping delivery app fees. We hoped that by now we'd be out of the woods, but it's clear that we are still deep in the middle of this crisis. If restaurants are going to have any chance at recovering we have no choice but to extend those laws. We are also hearing an important bill by council member Donovan Richards today, which will require reporting on businesses who have received a grant or loan from the city. The past few months have been devastating for almost every type of small business in New York, but like every other aspect of this crisis, black and brown New Yorkers have been hit the hardest and we need an anti-racist recovery. And that can't happen unless we are working to make sure that minority owned businesses are getting the help that they need. Before I turn it back to the chair, I wanna thank everyone who has joined us uh, this morning, but also everyone that has worked on these issues all throughout this crisis. I see that Andrew Riggi is here and Rob Bookman and 
I know Christian Kostner is here from the Office of Special Enforcement and so many small business owners that have worked so hard uh, during this. Uh, I really just want to uh, thank you. I know it's especially challenging for small business owners to take time out of their busy schedules to be here today, but you all make New York what it is. So we'll be working to do everything we can to support you. And with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for convening this hearing today. And I look forward to uh, hearing these bills, passing these bills and doing more to support small businesses and restaurants in New York City. I wanna thank the other members that are here as well. Uh, Council Member uh, Rosenthal, Council Member Moya, Council Member Richards, Council Member Perkins uh, and Council Member Powers. Unless I missed anyone, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. I'd like to invite uh, a dear friend, Council Member Moya, who's been a partner uh, on this very important issue for over a year. And Speaker, you're absolutely right. When we talk about the pandemic and the crisis that, that we're in now, it's up to the city and the city council to make sure that our small businesses can survive so that we can thrive later together. And with that, I'd like to uh, invite Council Member Moya, our sponsor of one of the pre-considered intros to give a statement. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you uh, to Speaker Corey Johnson for your leadership uh, in always protecting our small businesses uh, throughout the city, especially during uh, this pandemic. Uh, your leadership has really demonstrated to us that uh, we are putting small businesses first. And of course, to my, uh, my friend and Chair, uh, uh, Chair Jonai, uh, for your support of small businesses and our local restaurants, and also for co-sponsoring our legislation to cap the fees uh, third-party food delivery apps can charge restaurants during the pandemic. Uh, the City Council voted overwhelmingly to pass that bill in May, and we're here today to vote out another bill that we've co-sponsored together to further define the time frame those fee caps will be in place for. As someone who lives and, and represents the early epicenter of the COVID outbreak in the U.S., I've witnessed the phases of this pandemic firsthand and how they've affected our local restaurants. I watched them have to shutter their shops and rely entirely on apps like Grubhub and these apps that were only too eager to profit off of the pandemic. Then I watched them begin outdoor dining at a dramatically reduced capacity as the city slowly reopened for business. Now some of them are asking for what happens next. Every restaurant I've spoken to or heard about has said how much they support any of these fee caps that we've passed. And now they're wondering when these fee caps will expire. They're asking because they know that no matter what the infection rate is now, they're still very much in the middle of the pandemic. Restaurants will be grappling with these consequences of this disease for some time. The one thing that we can and must do is to make sure that they're not grappling with the exorbitant fees from these third party food apps while they're struggling to keep their shops on life support. That's what this bill does. It requires that the fee caps remain in place until restaurants are permitted to operate at maximum indoor capacity. This will offer our local restaurants temporary protection from the billion dollar tech companies leeching off of them uh, for as long as the COVID, uh, as long as COVID forces patrons onto the apps and away from their tables. It's simple, it's logical, and it's necessary. I want to thank my colleagues for their support. I want to thank the advocates and, uh, the, and for the efforts. And I urge all of you to uh, please uh, help pass in, uh, this pre-considered introduction. Thank you. And I give it back to you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member Moya. And I Chair Jonah, you're on mute. Thank you, Council Member Moyer. I just want to thank you for your commitment and thank your staff for your, their unrelentless effort and focus on these important issues. While many uh, have been enjoying the summer to one degree or another, your office has been working hard on this issue. And for that, I'm really grateful. The restaurant industry and small businesses are grateful to you. I uh, want to get, I want to invite Council Member BP, I mean, Council Member Richards sponsor of nine, intro 1958 to give a statement. That was a Freudian slip. Sorry, BP. I'm just sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you always start in trouble, but thank you, uh, Chair Jonai, uh, for your leadership always in supporting small businesses. 
uh, to our speaker. Thank you also for your leadership in moving uh, this important package of bills. Uh, I am Donovan Richards representing the 31st District covering Springfield Gardens, Laurelton, Rosedale, and the Rockaways. And today we are here in my introduction number 1958 in relation to reporting on financial assistance received by small businesses impacted by COVID-19. Uh, the bill requires the Department of Small Business Services to prepare a reporting a report detailing which businesses receive a grant or loan from the New York City Employee, Employee Retention Program or New York City Small Business Continuity Loan Fund, both created to help small businesses with revenue losses because of COVID-19. The report will include the name, location, and amount of grant of the grant or loan. SBS gave to each business. SBS will also submit the report to the mayor and the speaker of the city council and make the information publicly available by posting the report on its website. This bill is critical uh, because it ensures that during these difficult times for our small businesses that the Department of Small Business Services is doing all, it's can, all it can to ensure that they are receiving the financial resources that they need. I, I do have a long statement, but I'm going to uh, cut it short and just say that this bill is all about uh, transparency and accountability. And as our speaker and chair alluded to, when you look at the disbursement of where these loans and grants went, it's very clear that the outer boroughs were certainly shafted during this process. I think 66% of the uh, retention loans and grants program went to Manhattan. Last I checked, we are a city of five boroughs. And as we talk about the disparities that we've seen uh, impact many communities around the city, it is no different for our small businesses. We're starting to see too many rental signs up in our communities. We've heard the reports and know firsthand that many black and brown businesses will find it hard to actually get back on their feet uh, post this pandemic. And I wanna hear from SBS on how they're looking at this from an equity lens as we move forward. So we wanna make sure everybody bounces back that their support for all of our small business services. I wanna hear how our MWBE programs are certainly being uh, designated across the city as well and how we're helping to make sure that we can exceed goals during this time when we're talking about uh, addressing disparities in this city in a bigger way. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for holding this hearing. I look forward to hearing from SBS on how they're gonna do better to make sure that boroughs like Queens who got 9% of the loans and grants actually uh, are getting more of their fair share. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Council Member. Um, you, we've created or allowed the tale of two boroughs uh, and we're gonna fight that injustice and make sure that it's an equal playing field for all. And what's good for Manhattan is good for the borough of the Bronx, it's good for Queens, and it's good for Brooklyn and Staten Island. And we're all in this together, and together we're going to get to, through this, but it's going to require equal distribution and a fair playing field for all of us. So thank you so much for your intro. Uh, it is a just one, uh, and we're all looking forward to hearing from the administration on how we can correct this. I want to turn it over to our moderator, Committee Counsel Stephanie Jones, to go over some of the procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I am Stephanie Jones, Counsel to the Small Business Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist to give testimony will be Commissioner Doris, from the Department of Small Business Services, followed by Christian Klotzner, Executive Director of the Office of Special Enforcement. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. First, Commissioner Doris, followed by Executive Director Klossner. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. 
Commissioner Doris, Executive Director Klossner. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Doris? I do. Thank you. Executive Director Klossner? I do. Thank you. Commissioner Doris, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Jonai and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is John L. Doris and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I want to acknowledge my partner in government, Christian, Christian uh, Klossner, our Executive Director of the Office of Special Enforcement. Uh, it is my pleasure to testify uh, to you today and my sincere hope that each of you and your loved ones are staying safe healthy during these difficult times. In January, uh, we began to see the impacts of COVID-19 on businesses in commercial corridors across the five boroughs. Based on these concerns, we worked quickly to launch the New York City Employee Retention Grant and New York City Business Continuity Loan Fund to serve as a stopgap measure uh, to rapidly assist small businesses who were experiencing slower foot traffic and slump in sales while we waited for the federal government to respond. To date, through the New York City Employee Retention Grant, uh, SBS has approved financial assistance totaling more than $24.9 million and $22.3 million through the New York City uh, Business Continuity Loan Fund. We know that access to capital remains a major challenge for small business owners, and SBS is utilizing all our tools to connect businesses, business owners to the resources they need. Through these new initiatives, our broader financial assistance offerings, including the Contract Financing Loan Fund, we NYC financing products and technical assistance program via our N NYC Business Solution Centers, SBS has connected small business owners to more than 78 million in financing awards since the start of the pandemic. In June, we began to recover and reopen our economy. We wanted to make sure we did this safely so we can launch several uh, resources to, uh, to help businesses reopen and provide the necessary guidance and support. Our goal was to educate and help small business navigate the reopening process and stay up to date uh, with the latest health regulations. Through our reopening resources, we've, we've hosted over 92 webinars reaching over 2,600 attendees and publish plain language industry guides available in several languages. To directly engage the small businesses, uh, we created the launch the Restart Hotline. To date, we have received over 28,000 calls for reopening guidance, finance and assistance, uh, legal services, compliance support, and much more. SBS has done its best to be nimble and adaptable in addressing the challenges faced by our constituents. The city's open restaurants program which allows qual qualifying uh, restaurants and bars to expand outdoor seating is a prime example of the, of the agencies working together. We worked with DOT to establish the program, which offers an ex expedited approval process allowing restaurants and bars to self-certify their eligibility, extending their lifeline and helping local businesses get back on their feet. Over 9,500 restaurants are currently participating in this program. To ensure that businesses uh, participating in an open restaurants program understood how to comply with key uh, city rules, uh, we launched the virtual compliance consultant consultations open restaurants program, providing free virtual one on one consultations. The program aims to clarify existing regulations and helps businesses understand common compliance challenges. I want to reiterate that these consultations are at no cost to the small business. SBS does not issue violations or fines, and our compliance advisors are available to offer guidance and support in multiple languages. When I joined SBS, I committed to thinking creatively about how to effectively and equitably deploy our resources, double down on our community engagement, and connect small businesses with additional financing. Chair Joe and I appreciate the opportunity to walk your district with you and distribute PPE to small businesses and speak to them as well. We have continued this engagement and have 
worked with over 80 community partners to distribute 7.5 million face coverings, as well as creating a PPE marketplace where 52% of suppliers are MWBEs. In executing my five borough strategy, I continue to visit uh, different corridors throughout the city and, and directly listen to the challenges that small businesses are facing. We know that rent has posed an enormous pressure on our small business owners, disproportionately affecting our communities of color. Earlier this week, the mayor announced the continuation of the Commercial Lease Assistance Program, extending funding to offer free legal services to commercial tenants citywide. Through our Commercial Lease Assistance Program, SBS has helped 800 businesses with their lease-related issues. Since the onset of COVID, we have supported over 200 businesses, primarily from marginalized communities, understand the legal uh, requirements as they faced uncertainty around rent uh, payments and other lease related issues. We also partner with City Bar Justice Center via their Neighborhood Entrepreneurship Law Project to connect over 150 business owners to free legal assistance and support with navigating insurance claims, contracts, force uh, closures, and uh, access to federal relief programs. As small businesses started on the path toward recovery, some primarily in the Bronx were impacted by looting and vandal vandalism due to civic unrest. We partnered with the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City and private partners to launch the Small Business Emergency Grant Program. The fund uh, was created as an initial cash grant to help jumpstart small businesses and assist with recovery from loss and physical damages caused by looting. The grant focused on MWBEs and mom and pop shops with less than 1.5 million in revenue. We worked closely with local community organizations such as bids, chambers of commerce and local merchants associations to ensure that we reach those businesses that were severely impacted and needed support with gathering necessary documentation to complete the application process. Eight, we have 144 uh, completed applications with 138 grants paid out, totaling 1.23 million. In addition, our Workforce One centers have assisted over 600 businesses, connected New Yorkers to 10,000 job opportunities, and uh, filled over 2,800 jobs. Turning the page to the current and pre-considered legislation, I want to address Council Member uh, Moya and Chair Jonai on pre-considered intros 64. 39 and 6438, amending conditions for existing law, local laws 51 and 52 of 2020. While delivery apps can provide helpful marketing, infrastructure, and delivery services for small, small restaurants, particularly during the pandemic, small business owners have voiced concerns around the high cost of utilizing these delivery service applications. Extended relief for these costs will protect businesses during this difficult time. We are supportive of the extension and amendments and look forward to working together with the council. Additionally, council member Richards intro 1958 calls to support calls for SBS to report detailed information of recipients uh, such as name and business location, including cross streets, zip code and neighborhood, as well as the amount received from the employee retention program and small business continuity loan fund. We support the council's commitment to creating broader transparency around these awards as the city assesses its COVID-19 response. However, we hope to work with the council to enact legislation that balances transparency with business owner privacy. Thank you for providing me with this opportunity to update you on the work SBS is doing to help our small businesses recover from financial devastation. Caused by the pandemic, and how we can work together towards creating broader transparency around the disbursement of our awards. We have major challenges to overcome, but our city is at its best when we are working collaboratively and listening to one another. I look forward to our continued, uh, continued collaboration as we support our small business owners. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, we'd like to invite Executive Director Klossner to testify. Executive Director Klossner? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Great. Uh, good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chairperson Jonai, members of the Committee on Small Business, 
and other council members. My name is Christian Klosner. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Special Enforcement, or OSE for short, which is overseen by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. OSC's mandate originating from a mayoral executive order in 2006 is to coordinate efforts across city agencies to problem solve around emerging issues adversely affecting neighborhood cohesion, livability, and safety. OSC has served this function in numerous issue areas with the vast majority of this work over the past several years focused on preventing the housing loss and community disruption caused by illegal short-term rentals. Since the emergence of COVID-19, OSE has been engaged in new work streams related to the pandemic, including pursuant to a designation from the Corporation Council, taking a lead in investigating industry compliance with local laws 51 and 52 of 2020. Taken together, these laws prohibit a quote, third party food delivery service, end quote, from charging a food service establishment any fee for a telephone order if a telephone call does not result in an actual transaction, two, charging a delivery fee more than 15% of the purchase price of an order, and three, charging fees for the use of their service other than a delivery fee that total more than 5% of the purchase price of each online order. These laws carry significant penalties and enable the city to seek both injunctive relief and monetary penalties, including fines, restitution for illegally charged establishments, and attorney's fees. OSC pivoted quickly to support the implementation of this law. The office interviewed several restaurant owners and gathered documents to understand current fee structures. Letters were sent to those companies identified as meeting the definition of third-party delivery service and operating in New York City, including Grubhub and Seamless, DoorDash and Caviar, Postmates, and Uber Eats, explaining the prohibitions and potential penalties and expressing the city's expectation that the companies would adjust their fee schedules to be in compliance with the law. OSC also set up an email account, foodservicetips at osc.nyc.gov, to receive tips from the restaurant industry regarding potential noncompliance. I'd like to take a moment to thank those restaurant owners who took the time and effort during these challenging times to send information on charging practices and to raise issues of concern, as well as being available to me and my team for follow-up conversations. The tip line will remain open for the duration of the law and owners are encouraged to send evidence of charges that may be illegal to the tip line, which is again, foodservicetips at osc.nyc.gov. Foodservice tips is all one word. OSC is pleased to report that for the most part, it appears there has been universal compliance with a cap on fees relating to delivery services. And we have not heard of any instances where restaurants have been illegally charged for phone calls not resulting in an order. There have, however, been issues of what may be concerning practices relating to fees other than delivery fees. One company apparently charged 10% for orders which were picked up. Another company has taken the position that credit card processing fees are not covered by the 5% cap on other fees. OSC documented these issues in letters to the respective companies, inquiring about the practices and requesting both full compliance with the law, as well as any restitution for any restaurant charged illegal fees. OSC is currently engaged in discussion with both these companies about their fee structures, and both companies have engaged with us and are cooperating with the inquiries. OSC understood that the intent of local laws 51 and 52 was that they would be in effect until 90 days after restaurants were allowed to resume normal operations. Shortly after these laws took effect, the city entered phase two reopening and restaurants were permitted to offer outdoor dining under the open restaurant program, raising the question of whether there was still a declared emergency in effect. Despite the intent, it was clear that the law's definition of declared emergency as being when, quote, all food services, excuse me, when, quote, all food service establishments in the city are prohibited from providing food for consumption on premises, end quote, meant that there was no longer a declared emergency for purposes of the, these specific laws once outdoor dining began on June 22nd, 2020. Preconsidered intros 6438 and 6439 are welcome clarifications to how long the original local laws were intended to be in effect and the administration supports passage of legislation ensuring the provisions added by local laws 51 and 52 remain in effect until restaurants are allowed to open fully. 
Thank you again for the opportunity to provide testimony and I welcome any questions you have. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to questions from the speaker followed by Chair Joni. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Speaker Johnson, please begin. Uh, thank you to the committee council and all the committee staff for their hard work on this hearing. Uh, this uh, is for the commissioner. Uh, commissioner, um, the partnership for New York City just put out a report a few weeks ago that really sounded the alarm on how bad things still are. They said that the accommodation and food service industries are quote sectors, this is their quote, sectors that will require drastic intervention to survive, drastic intervention to survive. So I wanted to hear from you. I know you testified a little bit about it. What does the city have as a plan for what to do next? And what other interventions should we be looking at to support and save as many small businesses and restaurants as possible? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, absolutely, uh, we uh, read the report. We. Uh, I've spoken with uh, Kathy Wild myself. Uh, we've been discussing this. And part of the solution, as you know, um, they have a multi prong approach to it. Uh, part of it is creating a clearing house uh, with EBC where uh, SBS will be participating um, and on also calling on the private sector uh, to help and support in philanthropy and also uh, to engage in this process. Look, um, as you mentioned, uh, you know, this everyone has got to come to the table. Certainly the city's at the table. Um, I believe our open restaurants program is addressing uh, some of the challenges that businesses have. Uh, but clearly, um, we know from small businesses, if we don't have indoor uh, dining, um, the challenge will still remain and uh, the capacity challenges and the limitations. So for us, um, we will continue to give the guidance and support that we've given. Um, we have walked our small businesses through the process. I think right now, understanding the regulatory environment and what they can and cannot do is one of the primary things that small businesses have asked us to address. Secondarily to that is a financial assistance. Uh, they've asked us, where can we find money? Where can you help us find resources? We've done that, as mentioned, to about $78 million. Um, we've also worked with uh, the hospitality industry about uh, expediting uh, processes, reducing fees and work with the council in agreement 100% with the council about dealing with the fee structures that we have right now uh, with the third party apps. And that's why uh, we testified um, in, in, in agreement with the, the council today on these challenges. Um, so so uh, Mr. Speaker, we, we certainly have uh, work cut out for us uh, continually. Our team's been working round the clock on this issue. Um, but we certainly, uh, you know, are in challenging times and uh, the drastic measures that we have to take, I believe, also has to include federal, both federal and also uh, state assistance. Um, I think at that point, uh, you know, being able to have long term borrowing, um, you know, so we can have more money so we can give get it out to the small businesses because that's a need they have right now. Um, I believe that's going to help us uh, get them back on their feet. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I mean, of course, on, on this issue, but also on homelessness and on the subways and on uh, rental assistance for residents and tenants, we need federal help. We need a, a federal yeah. stimulus bill that has help in all these program areas, but also has revenue replacement money for uh, states and localities to be able to help shore up some of these programs and double or triple down on some of these programs that we know work and yeah. saving these small businesses. I wanted to, to just mention that one of the biggest complaints that I have been hearing from restaurants and businesses generally is the lack of certainty on reopening plans. When will indoor dining be allowed? What about gyms, museums? What are the metrics that we're using to determine what's safe? Are we talking to the state about this? I am not with this question. I am not saying that we should rush these things, but the reason why I'm mentioning those questions is because how is a business supposed to continue to pay rent when they have no idea what the future holds? 
if we are waiting on a vaccine or a treatment or some other advancement and air filtration, maybe we need to say that so that these type of small businesses actually have some sense of how long they need to be downsized for, how long they need to be negotiating with their landlord for on putting off their rent. Uh, you know, what is their relationship with their distributors and suppliers? Uh, it's hard as a small business to be able to make these decisions without having a sense ahead of time of how the city and state are reaching these benchmarks or creating new benchmarks. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. How are we giving uh, businesses the ability to plan in advance to be able to continue to stay open even at a fraction of what they were doing before uh, and just keep their heads slightly above water if they don't have a sense of the things that I just outlined uh, in my question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you are absolutely right. I, you know, we, we talk to small businesses every day. As I mentioned, our, our hotline, 28,000 calls uh, in just a month and a half, you know, from our small business asking for help and, 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 and clarity, um, not only on the regulatory environment, as I mentioned, but really how do they forecast? Uh, you know, what's going to happen? Like, how do I keep my employees? Who do I bring back? And, you know, they have to have a sort of structure uh, in place in order to address uh, what the future looks like in order for them to prepare for it. So, look, I, I hear you. I agree with you. Um, the health crisis really uh, that we faced really brought on this economic crisis at a, at a more uh, devastating rate, even to our minority communities and women-owned uh, business community and uh, immigrant communities and uh, Certainly, the, the the uncertainty is a challenge at the moment. Uh, I would say that that uh, you know we are listening, uh, of course, for the state to give us direction. We follow the direction of the state. The state tells us what we can and cannot do uh, when it comes to reopening. Uh, we do agree that we need some additional certainty. The mayor did provide an extension of the program to October thirty first, um, and then also a guarantee that the program will uh, also come back next year. And so. Uh, we are hearing from uh, some of our small businesses that at least they have an inkling there uh, of surety from the city uh, as it pertains to the out open restaurants program and open streets open restaurants program, um, you know, that it will be back, that they will have an opportunity to participate and that we've extended the timeline, the mayor's extended the timeline uh, to October 31st. But I do hear you. I think, um, you know, the challenge is real and, and, and certainly uh, whatever information we get, we immediately pass it on to our small businesses. Uh, we communicate with about 200,000 of them every single week um, it would, with newsletters and conversations and trainings, as I mentioned. Uh, they, they know what's coming down. So what, as soon as we get it, we're giving it to them. But, uh, you know, we are following the state, as you know, um, requirements and also uh, the health profession. So uh, we do share that, that grief and concern. I know that we are in uh, dire straits financially as a city. Uh, we had to pass a budget that had a $9 billion hole in it. Uh, we are worried that even next year's budget could be worse if we do not get state and local aid, further cuts from Albany and uh, not enough revenue coming in because we don't have the tourism and we don't have the business revenue coming in. But has SBS tried to figure out how much more we stand to lose if small businesses keep going under? Have we tried to project that? Yeah, I mean, we are uh, speaking with our colleagues at the city to figure out the metrics. Um, there are several versions of what that number looks like. Um, we're still working through that process. Um, we probably will make that known, what we anticipate. But look, we've got 230 thousand small businesses and that's small businesses with employees right and so um, about 65 percent of them have five employees or less um, if we hear projections if a third or so go away I mean you can you can feel the impact um, that that's going to have on our economy and so um, while we are running the numbers and we're looking at the projections um, that's coming out of the federal government and also uh, um, out of uh, out of the Treasury Department who's also doing some forecasts, we are compiling all those forecasts uh, by region. By the way, a lot of that data was really um, 
was uh, aggregated and we were trying to like break it out to specific to the city. Um, but once we, we will definitely be sharing our, our thoughts on that uh, in the near future, but, but that is a concern for us. You know, uh, again, we have uh, three plus million jobs that small businesses uh, employ here in the city. Uh, and we are very concerned about that economic impact and the, the, the effect it's gonna have um, on the city in general and it's having right now. So we do agree with you and we are looking into that. Okay, I have two final questions then I'll turn it back to the chair. I understand that the loan and grant program were created and put online as soon as possible to serve uh, stopgap measures for restaurants before federal relief came. Do you think that those programs, by judging them now, were successful programs? Um, I believe they, they were successful um, in the sense that we were able to get some money out of the door very quickly. And um, within a matter of weeks, it, it was all, it was all um, accounted for. Certainly the challenge that we're hearing today about borough diversity and making sure that we get to the communities um, around the city. I think that's a challenge that we have committed and, and have committed the last time at the budget hearing and uh, with our colleagues here um, that we will uh, work towards uh, correcting that and also uh, making sure we double down on our outreach, et cetera, into those communities. So. Um, it was a success in the sense that it got out the door. I mean, was it what we needed? Uh, absolutely not. We needed a significant federal influx of dollars to actually help. I mean, the PPP loan program, as you know, uh, pushed out billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and uh, of course, New York City, again, uh, were challenged because we didn't get, uh, we believe, uh, the total number that we should. And so this is an ongoing challenge. Um, but I do hear you uh, on the concern about the borough diversity, but as a just getting money as quickly as possibly out the door within a matter of weeks, we were able to do that uh, with whatever we had, um, but certainly want to increase our borough diversity there. And then lastly, Commissioner, do you think that SBS uh, did enough during these last few months to provide support for minority owned businesses, women in minority owned businesses? Thanks so much. Um, you know, I believe that we uh, we did uh, quite a few things. I uh, working with the mayor's office of MWBE, which I oversaw before I became the SBS commissioner. Um, as you can imagine, um, the pandemic uh, really, I think, zeroed in on uh, historic disparities that were already evident, both in the financial sector, uh, both with our city's procurement process, both with our uh, just the the, the general uh, business climate. Um, that our minority businesses face. And certainly, um, I think we, we were able to do uh, quite a bit of things and connecting those firms uh, to opportunities and zeroing in on the specific needs that they have and providing alternatives to, uh, to what they have in the marketplace. For instance, um, in our program, the, if you are an MWBE and you receive a contract with the city, uh, we zeroed out our interest uh, to that contract finance loan fund and you know, it was at 0% now and, and, and we upped it to half a million, as you remember, uh, that the, the uh, MWBEs can get. And so, you know, the challenges, you know, still, they need more, more than that. We didn't have the resources totally, again, because of the enormity of the challenge. Uh, but we did do webinars. We partner with organizations like 100 Black Men, um, with the National Urban League. We've, we've re done outreach. Um, extensive outreach into the community, et cetera. And uh, we will continue to do that. But we certainly uh, know that that is an acute need. That is a need that has been there before the pandemic. And certainly um, we have some great challenges ahead in getting those businesses back up and running. And then thank you, Commissioner. I, I appreciate you being here today. I want to thank Christian Klossner for his hard work as well. I don't have any questions. Uh, for him, but I want to thank Christian for his partnership with the council, not just on this, but on fighting illegal hotels, which we've worked uh, with him on uh, for years. And uh, I just want to say we need our small businesses to survive uh, and get through this crisis. Yeah. They are the lifeblood of New York City. I can't imagine any neighborhood across the city without the local bodega, the local diner, the local uh, you know, uh, cuisine spot that people love. Um, and we need to do everything we can, even with the limited financial resources that we have currently 
because of an absence of federal leadership, we need to help these businesses survive and stay in business and ride out this crisis. So I'm proud of the work the council has done in working with uh, you all and with some of the folks I mentioned earlier from the Hospitality Alliance related to open streets, open restaurants, uh, these third party app fees. We need to continue to be proactive to push the envelope to get relief and help these businesses weather this incredibly difficult storm. So with that, I wanna turn it back to you. Mr. Chair, thank you for indulging my questions and thank you for chairing this hearing today. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the great questions um, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, we're in this together and uh, coming together, we're gonna to get through this. Commissioner, uh, thank you for your responses. You know, I guess we are both committed and passionate about small business. That's evident. The 28,000 phone calls that you received, and I think you stated asking for help. They're not asking for help, they're crying for help. And we're not there for the small businesses that have contributed so much and continue to give back to this city, this administration has not done enough, not nearly enough. And when we say we're there for support, we're there for them, we hold webinars, we answer their questions, but we point the finger always toward the federal and we know that the feds must do more and they have to do more. And we know that the state has to do more. But the question is, what are we doing to help these small businesses survive? What's within our power to give them all of the resources that they need to survive? We've had this conversation so many times. The things that are in our power our real estate taxes, water and sewer charges, uh, sales taxes, income tax, giving them the immediate funding that they need to rebuild their business models, giving them the ability and the tools that they need to survive, and the rhetoric about, well, we're waiting for feds and we're waiting for state and we're waiting for this, where small businesses have always done their part. They've taken the risk. They've been the creators. They've invested. They've redeveloped. They continue to employ. They continue to build our communities. They give back tax dollars. Commissioner, the total city's grant and loan program, I believe, was 47 million, am I correct? It's 40, yes, 40, 47 paid out. $47 million for roughly 230,000 businesses in New York City. Am I correct on those numbers? Yes, with employees. So let's do the math of 47 million. Divide that by 230,000. Is two hundred and four dollars and thirty five cents. That's how much the city values small business. That's how much the city has done their part in helping our small businesses in their most time of need. And when I say that, they didn't bring about the pandemic. They didn't decide which businesses are going to close and how they're going to reopen. They didn't decide how this city is going to get, help them get through this. They were forced shut down. And while they're forced to shut down or operate at a percentage of their business, we still say to them, hey, pay your taxes. Hey, pay your real estate taxes. And if you don't, we're going to hit you with interest and penalties. Hey, if you don't pay your, ta your water and sewer bill, we're going to cut your water off. We're going to pay you with penalties. And we're going to put judgments and liens against you. We've stacked the deck against them. Why aren't we doing more? 
the budget of New York City that we just passed was roughly $89 billion. Why aren't we giving them a fighting chance? And not in words, it's show me how much you love me. Show me how much you value you me. The words are great and that's for moral support is wonderful. Show me in the terms of dollars. Maybe you can answer that question. And I know that there's so much to say there, Commissioner, and it's not directed toward you. And if you had a magic wand, I would imagine we'd be somewhere else. But you're the one that's speaking for the city and this administration. $204. I think that was a number. $204.35. That's how much you're showing our small businesses how much New York City loves them and appreciates them. The cost of a lunch or a dinner. Thank you, Commissioner. Maybe you can respond. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, look, I think I think you know we share that passion for small businesses. Um, I think I certainly wouldn't be in this chair um, if, if that wasn't the case. And um, being a former small business owner myself, understanding the realities and the challenges of, of meeting meeting your payroll and, and meeting your obligations. And and so I I, I hundred percent uh, hear you. And you know, as we've said before. As we talked, um, you know, a lot of those proposals and proposals around uh, even business interruption insurance, um, all these proposals we've, we've heard and we're pushing for uh, some changes. Um, it's not to deflect really uh, the, the responsibility of our uh, office, but it's really to speak about the enormity of the challenge that we are faced with. And I think for me, that is why we are saying that we need to get federal help and assistance to, because you know, we have a $9 billion gap here, as you know, and how do we, uh, you know, how do we support our small businesses? And that's part of the challenge um, that we had forth. Uh, you know, look, we, we've set aside the $49 million for those two programs, uh, but we did connect uh, and, and continue to work with our small businesses to connect them to, to other opportunities. Um, so our total was around 78 million, getting closer to 80 million that we've helped small businesses connect to other opportunities with our 40 lenders that we have out there and also uh, to the federal government PPP program uh, that has been uh, able to help uh, some of our small businesses. So I hear you, sir, on that. Uh, I certainly agree in the sense that we've got to figure out uh, where we get the resources from uh, to do this. And I totally agree with you on, on the, the normity and the challenge that we're faced with. Uh, and again, um, you know, this is this is in part that uh, did small businesses did not do and do this. This is not happening. This is no fault of their own. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we have to do everything. And I believe we are we are knocking on every door. We are speaking to our philanthropic partners. We are talking to banks um, every day. We're talking about financial institutions, where we can find money, where they can come alongside and work with us um, to help our small businesses, where they can change their policies. It'll make it easier for small businesses, their credit, uh, the credit requirements, all these things uh, we are doing um, that may not show up in, in, in the loan and grant program, which we had to essentially uh, close with such demand was in the first couple of weeks. But certainly we are working with the private sector, as I mentioned before, and looking for ways and, and the federal government as well to make sure that we have an opportunity uh, to get resources into the hands of businesses who need it. Um, and, and we've done that. No business out of those 28,000, they have not come to us, knocked on our door, and we were not able to help them. Um, we were able to help every last one of them and in some way, shape or form to get them what they've asked us for. And we will continue to do that. So certainly appreciate the advocacy and working with you, sir. I mean, I think, you know, it's been a great, uh, great, uh, you know, uh, thing to come together and to work, to go out to meet with those businesses and to hear firsthand in your district and many of the other council members districts um, about the challenges that they face. And we certainly wanna help them to meet those challenges uh, and certainly appreciate your concern there and, and we share it. Thank you, commissioner. And, I, and it's, I don't wanna to continue to beat on this one issue, but I can't let up. The small businesses that you've engaged with, that I've engaged with, that we hear from, in particular, the restaurant industry, which is really suffering. 
the hotel businesses, which are really suffering. Every mom and pop shop is really suffering. In an $89 billion budget, the message to our small businesses is 47 million. That's how much we value. $204, and that $204 hasn't been dispersed equally. We've also decided who is gonna get that money because it's evident not everyone did. And it's not right. The message is clear that in the city of New York, you may have been here for decades, you may have been a second and third generation small business, and yet in your most time of need, the city has turned their back on them. This is not my position. This is in black and white. You've turned your back on them and the city was not there for them. This administration was not there for them. And those are cries that you received, not calls for help. In 2019, the restaurant and eating establishments generated over $21.9 million in sales tax collections. Sales tax. And the amount of money that the mayor set aside for the Loan and Grow program was how much? Twice that. That's just one industry of the 230,000 businesses in New York City. One industry. That's how much we've given back. And while you say we'll reach out to our philanthropy and we'll reach out to our partners, you hold the purse strings. Commissioner, during this pandemic, what um, uh, permits and fees have you waived? None. What taxes have you waived? None. What economic stimulus have we provided them? Almost none. We have not done our part, Commissioner. We have not shown ourselves as partners, Commissioner. And while those small businesses are out there trying everything, risking everything, borrowing, taking from savings, taking from retirement to keep their doors open, we say our answer is the Fed and the state. All those things that I outlined are within our power. Our power. Not a single regulation, licensing, renewal permit fee besides open streets, sidewalk cafe has been removed. Not one. Taxes, don't pay on time, penalty. Forget waiver. How do we go back to our districts? How do these council members go back and say, we're there for you? When we're not. What is the message that you want me to give our small businesses in New York City besides Fed's state? What is that message that you want all those that are listening today to hear that this administration is going to give them? If you can answer, Commissioner. Yes, yeah, certainly. So, you look, I, I, as, as mentioned, you know, we are doing everything we can. We are answering every question that we're given our small businesses. If the city does not have the money because of our budget deficit, we are connecting them to finance and support. We walk them through the process and we give them uh, all the help they need, white glove service all the way through and we were able to help a significant number of businesses in that process. I think that is what we're doing and we hear you on the other pieces. Um, the city mayor also, I had announced back several years ago concerning fines and fees in which we were able to make adjustments there with the council's help. And we were able to do some of that where businesses are saving $20 million a year so far from those programs. Um, and also, you know, we will continue to do that. Uh, you know, I think we're deepening that and looking at those as well to see where else 
can we make the adjustments? So I think we are aligned on principle uh, what you know small businesses need. Uh, certainly, again, I mean, our financial constraints is, is uh, really um, where what's hampering our ability to do more when it comes to the actual direct financial help from the city, but in the sense of where we cannot support or we don't have the financing to do so, no small business is coming to us and walking away without getting the help. If they say we need financing, we connect them to that financing and we are there with them from beginning to end so that they can get uh, the resources that they need. And I think that is a value um, to our small businesses. It's a value to them who have walked away when the city uh, program may have had to close because we didn't have the, the resources in that because of the pandemic. And we connected them to a federal resource or a, a philanthropic resource. And they had got those resources, those grants or loans. I think it's a valuable thing to them. And then, you know, that's why we're here. We're all set up to help them with our business solution centers um, across the city, um, with our workforce one centers, helping connect our small businesses uh, to employees, but also giving folks jobs. So we are, we are uh, in agreement on that. And certainly uh, we're gonna continue to do that work. Um, that's significant work. Thank you, sir. Thank you, commissioner, but employees and jobs and helping them, pointing them in the right direction uh, is not what they need. And uh, there are plenty of financial institutions which are denying applications. And the question again, I'm gonna harp on this, if the federal dollars aren't there, if the state is not there, what, uh, what is the message that you want our small businesses to hear today? Because you can't control what the financial markets do and where they're gonna lend their money and how much. And if the federal dollars don't come in and the state dollars don't come in, what is the message that you want those small business to hear today? And not, the, not a politically correct answer. They're, these are businesses that are suffering and are waiting to hear from us. Pointing them in the right direction is not gonna do it for them. Yeah, so, you know, again, I'll say this, and we've said this uh, to our small business community and been responsive to them. Um, one, uh, SBS is here for you. We are here to help you through this process, and we have done that. I mean, tens of thousands of businesses, and I really, uh, you know, want to reiterate that fact. That is not something light. Uh, we can't tell you all those tens of thousands of businesses that we've helped get financing, support, or you know, trained how to pivot, help them in the open restaurants program, all these things to help them get revenue back up again, uh, that they're insignificant. We understand the scalability of our challenge. We understand the issues that they're dealing with, but, you know, we are here for them. And um, they can't, they, they've never picked up the phone or done, uh, called us and we're not there to answer the call. So we are here for you. We're SBS, we're the small business services. Uh, your advocates here in the city. We will make sure that whatever you need, we will get you it. And we'll do our best to make sure that whatever financial support you need, you will get. And that we are working on the regulatory environment as well here at the city to make sure that you have a, a, a platform to conduct business in a way that is not punitive, but in a way that encourage growth. And that's, that's our plan and we will continue to do so. Commissioner, what they need is waiving of real estate, water and sewer, uh, sales tax payments. That's what they need. They need more clarity on the open streets program that we've, uh, we've asked them to invest money that they don't have into making accommodations for outdoor seating that they didn't have, put up barriers that, for money that they did not have to tell them that the barriers that they put up are not acceptable, so go change them again. That's what we've done to them. We've made them spend more money that they don't have. At the same time, we demand that they pay sales taxes, income tax, real estate tax, water and sewer charges. That's what we've done. Commissioner, I get more calls from restaurants that follow DOT's policy regulations to find out that a sheriff shows up and tells them to shut down right now before he pulls their liquor license. That's what we've done to them. We put them on a, on a, a breaking point. They've 
They don't have the ability financial. There's nothing there. But now we've put them in a position to invest more money into something that they can't possibly comply with. Sheriffs right now, as we're holding this hearing, are visiting restaurants and telling them to shut down before they lose their liquor license and face more fines. What are we doing about this commissioner? Yeah, so I want to just point a clarification. The state controls the liquor license. That's not us. Um, and, and we have stated our challenge to the state about how uh, that process is going. We have uh, communicated. Uh, we are concerned about um, you know, liquor license being lost, uh, even at a disproportionate rate um, in, in certain communities, uh, black and brown communities, uh, LMI communities. That is that is a concern for us, and we we again we do not. That's the state liquor authority, and we have we have said that that is a concern. Why you know we do not want our uh, restaurants to lose their liquor license. That's their bread and butter right there. Without that, uh, it's it's survival is bleak. Uh, and so uh, what we have done uh, for restaurants who have questions, we are doing right now. We started virtual con uh, consultations. That means. A restaurant can call us, say we need a help or we need to understand this process. And we will literally sit on the phone, which we have with them by video and walk them through that process as well. Uh, all these tools have been so helpful to these restaurants. Again, we have 9,500 restaurants in this, in this uh, program set up in a matter of uh, you know, days uh, and, and got it turned around, an uh, expedited process with no fees self-attestations, everything that the industry, we've worked with the Hospitality Alliance and others on wanted, we make sure that happened. Um, certainly uh, we are seeing almost 90% compliance or more when it comes to the rules there. And so look, I think we all know these are challenging times and uh, you know we're doing everything we can to support those businesses and get them the information because that's a key. You know, how do I set up? Where do I set up? We do that, and we do that on a consistent basis to our uh, and for our small businesses to the tunes of thousands of them, and we will continue to do that. Commissioner, there's so many questions that other council members have, and I don't want to take away, and I don't want to continue to uh, take up the valuable time. Commissioner, our own city agencies are not have not interpreted this the laws um, uh, unilaterally from our own city agencies, let alone the discrepancies at a, from the city and state level. And I'm still not sure, restaurants are still not sure, who decides compliance when it comes to open streets? Who decides that they are legally permitted to have outdoor dining and what are the policies when you say one thing and we have sheriffs and marshals out there saying something else? You need to address this. You need to reach out to the, your counterpart in the state, come up with a unified plan that will address this once and for all. And until that is done, they should not be picking and choosing which restaurants are targeted. Social distancing is one thing. We're talking about regulations and showing the permits and authorization that is being challenged. And to threaten someone to liquor license and fees and fines that are tens of thousands of dollars is not fair. Um, Agree. And if you can make a commitment on the record that you're going to look into this with the state and address this so that we can do our part by informing our small businesses, our restaurants, how to comply. And here's your guide that will be both city and state. And no one is gonna come down and ask you to do something otherwise. Will you commit for them to hear and then get back to us so we can put it out there universally and say, here is your procedure. City and state has determined this is the acceptable uh, requirements for you to operate your place of business. So I would say that, we, you know, we, we, we already do this, um, you know, as a city agencies, we have a coordination uh, team. We, from the launch of this program, uh, again, there is a, I wanna make sure that we understand the, the 
division of labor here. You know, the state oversees the liquor authority, the city, well, DOT helps us with making sure that uh, folks are safe in the street if they're gonna go to the uh, curbside uh, model and uh, you know make sure that they're doing everything as safely as possible. Um, and then we are getting you know, the requirements from the state as to social distancing and all those other pieces. And we have trained, again, these programs are up, we are training, we're telling folks what to do. Um, we have guides out, we have uh, animation guides, we've got uh, actual guides where are in the stores, in the restaurants, we're delivering them. Hundreds of thousands we've, we've got out the door. Um, you know, and, and so we will continue to do that. And so, uh, you know, we say if folks have concerns or questions, they can call us, um, you know, 888-SBS-4NYC, you can call us and our compliance uh, helpers will be there to make sure that you uh, follow in the guidelines and that you explain everything that you need. And certainly we are committed to that. Well, that's what we're currently doing. And we've been doing for the past, uh, you know, a month and a half since reopening has started. Uh, but certainly there's some gaps um, in, in restaurants who are now coming on. And we're also out there to let them know uh, what those rules and regulations are. Certainly on the SLA piece, uh, that is, a, you know, we are in con contact with them too. Uh, our city agencies are speaking with them on a consistent basis. Um, and we are articulating to them the, the concerns that we're seeing on the ground. And, and, and we're over saying it over and over and over again. Um, and so I, you know, I do hear you, sir. And I agree um, that if they need help, SBS is here to help you with that process. Nisha, thank you. My last question, and we're gonna have to move on. Intro 1958 would require SBS to report on a list of businesses who received your grants and loans. Have you been storing this data thus far? Do you currently categorize them by borough, by industry, whether they're minority or women owned? When can we expect this? Uh, when can we get a transparent review available to know where uh, the funding has gone? By business, by industry, by borough, uh, and, and if, by minority or WMBE. Yeah, certainly. So, you, you know, we, we, uh, um, we do track these things. Um, you know, there is a, we, we do say that we support the, the, the uh, tenants of the bill in the sense that we want to make sure that we have the ability to uh, preserve a business privacy. Um, but certainly on, on the items, some of the items you've listed, um, you know, where, where the businesses are, what neighborhoods they're in, what industry uh, you know, they're in, uh, we support uh, creating broader transparency around it. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner. Now we have one question before we open to the colleagues to uh, OSE, uh, uh, Mr. Klausner. Um, you indicated that you have your data solve problems, uh, the instances and um, a phone charge, erroneous uh, charges have not been uh, occurring, but you have said that there were incidences of fees above the permittable amount caps that we um, uh, capped into have been violations. Have you issued any fines or violations? How many notices or how many um, violations of these laws have you found? And if possible, by which uh, third party food uh, uh, vendor? Uh, we, we Thank you for the question. We have not issued fines or violations. The the goal, um, you know, one of the reasons that our office uh, was brought in was to look at this from what is the most efficient way to enforce this. With so few industry, so few players in the industry, um, our goal is to take any incidents of a problematic overcharge and look at it on an industry wide level. Right, that if we hear from one restaurant that they believe they've been overcharged, our goal is to go to that industry and get compliance across the entire city that protects all other restaurant owners. And especially what we don't want is an enforcement regime that shifts a lot of the burden onto the restaurants um, in a time where we know they're struggling to make ends meet to have to take time out of their schedule to gather documents and come to us. We'd rather take notice of one instance, go right to the company, say, what's going on here? Can you stop? So we've issued no fines. Uh, fines are on the table. If we, if we aren't getting compliance, if we can't get 
restitution um, if where charges were illegal. Um, if we, the next step would be litigation. Um, we we're hoping we can continue to get compliance uh, either just through the law or through talking to the companies. If, if that doesn't happen, we'll certainly come back and let you know. Um, I, I prefer not to say the companies um, simply because I, I would hate for this hearing to turn into a back and forth um, while we're having negotiations with those companies' attorneys. Uh, currently, uh, if we take any public actions, we'll, we'll certainly uh, be announcing the name of the company at that point. Mr. Klasner, those violations aren't being issued to restaurants. The failure would be on the part of third-party food delivery apps. Um, no, I, I understand that. And I apologize for cutting you off, but I, I, let me clarify. And, and then if I, if I don't, I'm happy to turn it back over. What I'm saying is that um, as a victim or as a complainant, a restaurant would have to take the time to provide specific documents, logins, lots of extra information. Um, I, I don't want to put that burden on restaurants. What I want to do is if one restaurant says, I think I've been overcharged, here's an email. I want to go to the company and put the onus on them to say, are you complying with law? Why aren't you complying? And if you're not, what can we do to get the money back, not just for the one restaurant that complained, but for all restaurants that have been overcharged? Are you at liberty to say how many complaints you've received? Um, well, we didn't set up a specific complaint line. We set up the tip line that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I, you know, not, not more than a dozen. Um, as I said in my testimony, there has been wide scale compliance with the law. Um, you know, but we've partnered uh, with restaurant specific restaurant owners that have reached out both before and after the law's effective date um, and the industry writ large to make sure that we have open channels of communication so that as soon as there's a problem, we're made aware and we can address it on a, on a systemic and industry-wide level. Thank you, Mr. Klausner. Let me um, refer you. back to uh, Stephanie Jones for the uh, members that have questions. And um, I'm sure that we uh, will continue both with you and uh, Commissioner Doris. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet used the function, please raise your hand now. You should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced that you may begin before delivering your testimony. First, we will hear from Councilmember Richards, followed by Councilmember Powers. Councilmember Richards. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you to the Commissioner again. Uh, just some brief questions. Um, so during the Small Business Committee hearing in April hosted by my colleague, uh, Mark Jonai, and previous Commissioner Greg Bishop, uh, according to Small Business Services, around 8 million of the 20 million loan program for struggling small businesses was dispersed, with 66% going to Manhattan-based shops, while those in Queens received only 9%. And as uh, Councilmember Jonai, Chair Jonai alluded to, the Bronx receiving 1%. Since, uh, since then, have those numbers increased? If so, how and can you provide us with a report on where we're at? Uh, in terms of more equity and the disbursement of those funds and loans. Commissioner, you may be muted. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, council member. Um, uh, yeah, so, so as, as mentioned, you know, as we, we rolled out the program, it was one that was done with, with very expeditiously and making sure that we're, we're getting to our small businesses. So as you, as you mentioned, um, I could just give you just briefly that on the grants program uh, for Queens we're around 17% and for the loans program, I think we're around um, at this moment, uh, around 12% in awards. Um, in the, you said in the, in the grants? In the grants 12%. program, the grants mm -hmm. are the grants about 17%. Okay. Um, that's 19% and out of 19% of the applications. So 17% uh, were to Queens. And then on the loans, 18% applications overall in the pool, 12% went to Queens. And, and happy to provide a full breakdown to the you and your team. Sure, and you recognize that's why this bill is so important to make sure right. that we are bringing equity. And, and how did, why, I mean, did Manhattan 
have something special that Queens and other outer boroughs didn't uh, have in terms of getting that uh, percentage of the loans and grants so early on? Uh, and have you recognized that now coming in as the new commissioner that 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 the, the prior um, commissioner who I have a great deal of respect for um, certainly could have uh, looked at this deep deeper and ensure that there was more equity and the disbursement of, of this program? And are you looking to make corrective actions in this area? And how are you doing that as the new commissioner? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think as, as mentioned in my opening statement, part of um, uh, my five borrow strategy um, is, is to make sure one, uh, from the inception of any program or ideas or uh, uh, any work that we do that we take into account this reality, right? That we have five borrowers and every uh, borough has to be able to uh, get the services uh, and the resources that they need. And I think that's important. I think also uh, really, uh, and, and we've said this, I think a little bit before about, you know, how do we do outreach? I think it's important. Um, different uh, communities, uh, we have to, uh, you know, tailor our outreach to different communities. Uh, some communities are, are you know, are uh, easily contacted uh, through, through say, say the web or email or something. Others, uh, we have to actually pick up the phone. Others, you have to physically be there. And so, you know, we, we're, we're thinking about that. That's something that we're working on. Um, and we're, you know, look, we're aggressively working with community partners as well. I think that is a huge component of what we shifted. So uh, relying really uh, on our community partners to, to work with us, to help us identify those areas and businesses in need. And then for us, when we talk about equity, we're looking at, you know, our LMI communities. And I think, um, Right now, the mayor, as you know, launched uh, a few weeks back um, our um, uh, from the racial inclusion and equity task force, uh, really a series of services that will focus on communities uh, who are uh, largely impacted by COVID that are predominantly out in the outer boroughs and providing free uh, business uh, corps to help them, consultants to help them. Um, to, to do mentorship. We have these programs that are all coming out and they're gonna be focused in those out of our communities and LMI communities uh, to work specifically uh, with those businesses. So uh, we have a five borrower strategy uh, and from inception of ideation all the way through execution, I uh, began to implement that uh, as the new commissioner. Thank you, commissioner. Uh, another question. So I'm assuming there were some barriers uh, and partly because of some of the, the policy attached to the, both the loans and grants program. Uh, in particular, some restaurants were unable to take advantage of the grant program because of the four employee limit. Do you think that this was fair to an industry that often employs positions such as servers, managers, busing staff, chefs, and hosts? And are you in any way um, thinking about altering the program to broaden the appeal to small businesses who may not have been able to take advantage of the program um, based on the criteria that were set early on. Uh, thank you, council member. Absolutely, we're, we're, you know, we're thinking about uh, all criteria across the board. Um, in part, why we executed the emergency grant program uh, for those businesses that were looted, we ensured that we capped the annual income at 1.5 million. That means I'm gonna get to the smallest businesses that I can possibly get to. So those were, that's something that we are putting in, into uh, uh, action. I, I also think, you know, look, in, in, in the uh, challenge with our grant and loan program initially, we had limited funds. And again, we wanted to get to those very tiny, you know, micro businesses, um, you know, first, right? And I think that was part of why the program was constructed the way it was. Um, to get to those businesses that are four employees or less, um, and that we were able to help out uh, who were having some significant struggles initially in the process. Uh, but understanding that that was obviously a stopgap measure, and we just did not have the resources um, as a city um, initially to actually do uh, more there, uh, but we wanted the most vulnerable uh, and the most uh, micro, smallest of businesses, and that's what the program was uh, focused on at the time. So you're going to be broadening and broadening uh, the criteria a little bit more, you're saying, if I heard you correct. 
rather than just the four, will you be expanding the number of employees you can have? Well, I, I, I would say this, I would say that um, that answer will be yes, depending on the resources that we have. And if, you know, if we have the resources, uh, we, we will try to expand and include as many as possible. But you know, if for businesses, and, and I mentioned before, for businesses who uh, may be outside of a criteria, if we're really trying to micro-target um, to small businesses or LMI communities or so forth, um, you know, we just because the city is unable to do it, we can again find them resources and work with them with our white glove service. Meaning, from step uh, first step to the end, um, we are with them, um, and our business uh, consultants are with them through that process as well. So um, we're we're looking at the gaps where they may be, and so we are open uh, to where we can close those gaps, sir. All right, and then uh, this last two questions. Uh, one, uh, let me just ask. Uh, Will any of the, the program include street vendors and food trucks at all? Uh, for instance, in the areas like Jackson Heights, um, in Queens, I know that this has become a big issue. Are you considering any um, relief for them? And then lastly, um, if you can just touch, uh, you know, the, the number one thing I hear about is rent relief for business owners. And I've um, been speaking to a lot of business owners. Uh, Queens Together held an event. Uh, just a few weeks ago, where we heard from a lot of our immigrant businesses, immigrant owned businesses, people who put everything, uh, their life savings into starting businesses, who at the moment just can't hold on because of the astronomical rent prices and obviously the impacts of COVID-19 not being able to open up small businesses, their small businesses totally. Um, so is there any strategies around rent relief? And then also, if you can just speak uh, to street vendors and food trucks, and that'll be the end of my uh, questions. Uh, thanks, thanks, Council Member. Uh, so, as it pertains to street vendors and food trucks, and so I mean, those are businesses. Uh, you know, they they all uh, can apply for these programs. Um, you know, the programs are closed now, uh, unfortunately, uh, because um, for some time now. But certainly, when, if we are to open these programs again. Um, once you're a business, you can apply. I mean, all businesses can apply. Once you have a EIN number, uh, you are eligible for all of our programs. And so um, all those businesses have, and therefore they can participate. Um, I think on the- and, and did any of them receive loans or grants or no? I, I can, I'm not sure how many, um, but I, we can look into that for you. I'm sorry. But you're saying that they fit the, but you're saying they fit the criteria as well to apply. I'm saying if, if businesses have an EIN number. If they have an EIN number. Most, okay. most businesses have, they, they would fit the criteria, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then um, just on the rental questions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I mean, look, this is uh, really the number one challenge we're having right now with, with, with our small businesses um, outside of financing and, uh, and, and customers. Um, and you know, the challenge is how do they pay the rent and meet those requirements? And so, look, we, we've, we've instituted, um, as you know, uh, legal assistance to help them um, with that process with our commercial lease assistance program and our partner with uh, the bar, NYC bar, um, and, and really wanted to make sure that they have the ability to at least negotiate with their landlord uh, on the lease side. So we are looking at other uh, ways to support uh, small businesses on this on this side, um, but uh, you know I think the best the best way that we can support them right now, uh, while I think either uh, legislative bodies are looking at you know what type of relief or support can happen, um, you know our commercial lease assistance program is there for them, and and you know it's real easy for them to apply, and we work with them, uh, you know through that process and. and uh, Really help them on the legal side to, to speak with their manage, their uh, their landlords and give them the uh, ability to um, to renegotiate those leases um, and and have that have a free attorney um, to do that with them. So that's the support we're given as that's concerned. While you know other discussions are happening, I'm sure both at the federal, state, and and local level about what type of rent actual cash release can can be given. Well, thank you uh, for the work that you're doing. I look forward to seeing you. I know we had to postpone a few times, yeah. um, but I look forward to seeing you out here. And I'm hoping that, you know, the city is going to really explore ways to work with um, the private sector, 
uh, as well uh, in terms of trying to leverage opportunities. I hear the lawyers, but the, the lawyers, folks are looking for rent money and rent assistance. Uh, I don't think that they are, I mean, not to say that legal assistance is important, but when you have to make that rental payment, um, that seems to be the most critical thing at the moment. And I don't have to tell you about communities like Southeast Queens and the South Bronx, where we're starting to see a lot of rental signs going up. So for black and brown communities uh, and all businesses, I don't, you know, but specifically we're going to be hit harder just as COVID-19 has already shown us. And I'm really worried about the state of our communities in terms of blight and how do we address these issues um, and bring equity to them as well. So I look forward to our continued work together. I want to thank the chair and the speaker uh, for holding this hearing again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge that council members Rodriguez and Levin have joined us. Next up for questions, council member Powers followed by council member Rosenthal. Council member Powers. Thank you. Thank you to Chair Jonai and Councilmember Moya for your work here and, uh, and your advocacy and, and bringing this hearing together. So I, I thank you guys for all you're doing. And thank you to the Commissioner. Um, I appreciate everything you guys are doing. And I just want to echo what Councilmember Richard said, which is really the driving issues right now beyond legal assistance and things like that are rent relief, financial relief, and regulatory relief like not losing their licenses uh, as we're hearing from restaurants over trivial matters. And I do, I want to say, I, I do think this administration could be doing more uh, on all those fronts, even if it's just pushing back harder on the state's insane and bizarre rules around restaurants right now. They are taking people's licenses away for little to nothing. And I'm not making, I don't mean this to be a sharp criticism, but I do think the SBS and the mayor and this entire administration should be pushing back forcefully on the state for their bizarre and insane rules that are, right, are, are risking our own businesses' um, livelihoods. But um, so I, I'm happy to join you in any uh, an effort to do that. Um, before I ask about the third party apps, which I wanna I have a number of questions about, we talked about fines and fees just a little bit. And I, I had sent a letter to the mayor, I think it was about three weeks ago, asking for an update on the his state of the city proposal, which was called, I believe, fix it, don't fine it. And it was meant to provide regulatory relief through fines and fees and go through a list of fines and fees that have uh, that seemed achievable to either remove, to put um, longer periods or first warnings into effect and to do a number of other steps. They announced, I think, three or four at the outset of it. I joined that announcement in the press release. Um, but I wanted to know if there's an update on that. It was in February, it was right before the COVID hit. But it does strike me that at least one small step this administration can be taking is to be looking for ways to not take much needed revenue away from businesses right now and to cure those, uh, to help them cure those fines or fees where it makes sense, rather than just punishing them with showing up with a, uh, with a citation and, and making them go and pay a fee or a fine. Um, can you give me any sense of where any any sense of where that uh, that proposal stands right now? And also, um, just a simple question: Has this administration removed any fines or fees on small businesses since COVID started? Thank you, uh, Council Member, for that question. Uh, this pertains to state of city pieces. Um, yeah, you know, I certainly will get back to you. Let me get back. I, promise to do that on where we are with those. Um, certainly, as you know, uh, we have uh, over the last several years have been reducing fines, fee, um, putting in cure periods, all those things adding up to about 20 million a year uh, that we are saving small businesses um, the last several years. And so I, you know, I, I want to make sure I am um, speaking um, uh, very directly to the letter that you sent and the, the list. Um, so I will be certainly to get back to you on that. And, and for us, uh, I think the mayor, the mayor have said, I mean, even uh, if you look at the, the uh, street, the street, uh, uh, you know, the, the sidewalk cafes um, fees and so forth uh, with our open restaurants program, there were no fees, uh, all those fees were gone, removed. Um, it's a very uh, easy program, about five to 10 minutes, you can sign up without any sort of fees um, to self at the station, et cetera. And I think it's important. I think it's important for us to continue that, that work. Um, and so uh, on the broader fee structure and fines, 
Um, we, we, the mayor did uh, promise, as you mentioned, to double down on that. Um, we have seen, again, a 20 million or so dollars uh, in business, small business savings per year for the last several years. Uh, and so we will uh, get back to you on the specifics of the state of the city, uh, but we have dealt with specifically around the restaurant fee structure. We have dealt with that. And also um, we have uh, worked with, again, uh, many of our small business advocacy organizations uh, when we were putting out um, any of these requirements, uh, even for social distancing, et cetera, the mayor said that he wanted to start and have start, and we have start with a with an education first policy. And I think that's what we've been doing. Um, and so um, there's, in my knowledge, not ex excessive fees or a whole lot of fees being put out there. Um, uh, only really, you know, sometimes you have some real bad actors um, and, and that is not 95% of the businesses, right? So we're not, we're not talking about those uh, businesses. We're talking specifically about uh, the, 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 the small group that may, uh, may not adhere to the, to the policy. And even then the mayor had said education, a warning. And then if, you know, folks are just not trying to adhere to any of the requirements, then we will have to uh, impose other, uh, other um, penalties, et cetera. So uh, the, the short answer is uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, implemented some of these uh, structures and fees and re rethinking of fines and all that um, to an education first model. Um, and um, also uh, for the 20 or so million plus dollars we're saving every, every year, small business saving. And uh, we'll get back to you on specifically on the uh, state of the city uh, pieces that uh, we are in review of. Okay, and I'm gonna just say, I mean, I, I am not aware of any uh, relief during the COVID, during COVID. Uh, maybe there is, and I just missed it, but I but I don't believe there has been any, at least if I have seen. So I'm, or I say minor, I should say minor, but not as a result of the state of the city announcement. And um, we had asked for a full list. I presume when the state of the city happened, somebody put together a list for the mayor of all these different agencies, fines and fees that you guys looked at to repeal a few of them. So we've asked for that list or a list of various agencies and their fines and fees so we can take a look at them together and figure out which ones make more sense. Which ones is a discretionary amount we can bring to the lower end, we can do education and things like that. And I would ask, we sent it three weeks ago, it does take some time to go, oh. but we will ask for that list in, um, you know, very, very soon to, to have that um, sent back. Um, I just want to move over to the app since that's kind of the point of the, the hearing amongst other things. Um, we've taken up this cap. Can you tell me, have you seen other cities or municipalities taking up a cap uh, on third party fees? I think. Can you repeat the question? I apologize. Oh, I said, have we seen other cities? This is for either one of you. Have other cities or municipalities taken up a cap on third party fees the way New York City has? Uh, we have seen, we have seen other cities, um, Washington, DC, Portland, San Francisco, Philadelphia popped to mind. I think San Francisco um, went first and I, I, I'm sure there are other speakers actually who are probably monitoring this even more closely further down in the, in the witness list. Um, and you know, and we are looking at how the industry responds to those caps. Um, you know, from what we understood, there was early compliance in San Francisco. There's alarming news coming out of Portland about um, companies that are choosing to not comply. Um, fortunately, what we've seen in New York is wide scale compliance. Um, and it, whether that is the importance of the market to these companies or whether that is the, um, the careful drafting of, uh, of the original legislation, I, I think only, only time will tell and maybe some of the industry witnesses can speak to that. Got it. And do you know if other places, I mean, I, I do think probably some of the companies will be able to answer this better than, than any of us because they have widespread presence in the country. But do, do we know if any of the other cities or states have adopted our model? Is it, is it uh, we have the, I thought, you know, we have the two sort of, sort of structures here. Do you have any familiarity with other cities are doing it or have they adopted our legislation or have they done this in another way? I don't know if anyone has adopted our specific model. Okay. Um, this is for the SBS commissioner, uh, so I think you have to be unmuted. Um, um, you know, we have a model where we do marketing, and I'm going to ask this of the companies as well, just to be just to be clear. But 
Um, you know, one of the one of the model, you know, the model we have is basically you pay for listing yourself on the app. That's one, I think, um, one fee that is has a cap on it. And the other cap is around the delivery service. Do you know if I don't believe we do, but do you know if other cities and do you have an opinion on whether uh, or whether or how much of that fee should be the person who is making the delivery? So essentially, if you're charging for delivery, does that go to the delivery person and any of the other laws about whether that is the case? Laws in other places. Uh, I don't, I, 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 I can get back to you on that. I don't know, but I think um, I, I hear that I hear what, where you're going and, and, and some of the concerns you've heard that before, but um, I'm not sure if my colleague knows, but uh, we haven't heard um, the process in which it goes directly to the delivery um, person. Um, yeah, that we can sort of instead of going to the to the app company. Yeah, I'm, we have not heard. I have not heard that. Great, uh, Mr. Costner, do you have any idea? Um, I, I I've only uh, recently learned that in LA there's a model that doesn't restrain the fees based on which service. Um, and obviously, you know, we're going to be looking at that uh, that model, and and based on your questions, we'll be looking at others. And, and well, what do you, what continuing is that this mean? conversation with council, uh, from what I understand, there's a model out there where it, it doesn't break down what percent based on what kind of fee, but rather just a universal cap, and and the companies um, choose where to where to spend that money. Um, you know, we'll look carefully at that model um, and continue to work with committee council on. Uh, making sure that um, legislation meets the city's needs. Okay, meaning that they you just do one flat fee, you just pay. There's just one big cap fee. It doesn't specify what it's for. Right, and then uh, to your question, then you know that would that would leave in the hands of the industry whether or not, um, and what percentage of that money goes to the worker versus um, their own services. Gotcha. Okay. Um, uh, and and you're looking at that now. Yes. Can you report back to us anything you see about that? I think they said that was LA. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it does. I mean, I just I'm just going to raise a question. I mean, I do think I do wonder as I was I was rereading this the other day in preparation for this hearing, and I did ask my to solve myself the question of whether the delivery fee is going to the delivery person that's making the delivery. And if, and, and if not, how much of it is going to them? And so um, I'll ask the companies that question as well, but I just think it's worth a question we should all be asking as we're debating fee structures here around, um, around delivery. So thank you. Thanks both. I'll give my time. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Powers, Executive Director Klossner, and Commissioner Doris. My name is Alex Polanoff, and I'll be taking over moderating duties for the remainder of the hearing. Uh, next up, we have questions from Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Ro Rosenthal, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, uh, Commissioner Doris, I just, one quick question. The speaker had asked what could be done to help our small businesses. And one of the things I was hoping to hear you say is the possibility that we will keep the restaurant outdoor dining open beyond um, I guess it's September 30th now. Are you considering um, keeping the outdoor and the, the street dining beyond September 30th? That's something that's been successful. And, you know, certainly owners in my district as, as well as residents have asked, um, why not keep it going all year long? Yeah, thank you, council member. Um, so, you know, the mayor had extended it uh, to October 31st um, and also guaranteed that it will be back next year. And that was just mentioning that that was part of the, the positive part is give them an opportunity for, to forecast out. Um, and just, I'm sorry, you. and just to confirm, that's the um, not just outdoor dining, but on the street, they using the parking Correct. spaces until yes. October oh. 31st. Yes. Okay. Until, um, would you October consider 30. moving it beyond October 31st? Um, perhaps making that decision later, but um, soon enough so that restaurateurs could perhaps 
purchase those, you know, outdoor heating units, et cetera? Yeah, no, we are definitely looking into that. Um, right now, the mayor said it at October 3rd, but um, we have heard from, from the Alliance, we've heard from others uh, who are asking um, about that, the same question. So um, it is something that we're looking into. Um, I don't have an answer uh, today of if it's gonna go past October 31st, but that's something that we are looking into. And um, if if that's the case, as it was with the program, we want, we have to give notice um, as we've done for the 31st, but also that it's coming back next year uh, so that folks can adequately prepare for it. So I do agree um, if we are going to do that, it needs to be what done the, in a way that- um, Yep, thank you. What are the hurdles? What's holding you up from just making that decision now? Well, I mean, it's a collective decision. It's a citywide decision. And just going, I believe is we're just going, we're going through that process. Um, we're going through that process. Many agencies involved, as you can imagine. Um, and then you have, um, you know, what, what would it look like in, in winter? We think we're, we're, we're gathering information and from industry and also restaurants and our fellow city agencies to see uh, what are some of those challenges, but we are, we are certainly looking into it. I can, can let you know that. Um, and uh, if, if it is going to be changed, uh, we will give definitely ample notice. Honestly, if I were a restaurateur hearing that answer, I would be really disappointed. Um, of course, it takes working among the agencies. That, that's what that, that is how government works. Um, we're in the middle of an economic free fall. And to hear that the best you can give me at this juncture is we're looking into it is, is disheartening. If you're saying a hurdle is winter, you know, I imagine you talk with sanitation about plowing the streets and what the regulation would be around that. But again, I'm asking you specifically what the hurdle is from the perspective of a restaurateur who is trying to decide whether or not to keep his business open at all, his or her business open at all. Um, the, you know, we're in a pretty dire straits here. So what are the hurdles when do you think those hurdles will be resolved and there will be a decision? Yeah, I, I, I do not have a timeline on a decision. Um, I think, I, as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's an ongoing conversation we're having with our agencies and with the entire city and, and industry. Um, look, this program, we, um, we are very uh, happy with this program, as you can imagine. We stood it up in record time. Indeed. Um, Indeed. And this program and is really big it as we think success. Yeah, so, yeah. You set it up in record time, right? Because the circumstances are dire. Absolutely. And I think what the restaurant industry wants to hear is the same sense of urgency from you. Yeah, I think we have this sense of urgency. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We're, we're working on this 24-7. And our teams are working on this. Um, at the moment, I just I just don't have an answer as to your a specific yes or no um, because yeah. that is being worked out or when and how. Um, but right. I'm just sort of curious if your teams are working on it 24 seven. What is? Can you give me a specific example of a hurdle that's not overcomable or two hurdles that? you're working on, not necessarily not overcomable, but what are the exact hurdles that you're working with and what agencies are involved in working on them? Well, I'm not, again, I'm not, we don't, we don't have like um, uh, in a timeline and the challenges that are persistently um, available uh, to us, as we know, are obvious for the restaurant industry right now, and that they would like to have some sort of certainty for winter. Um, we don't have an answer for that yet. And I don't, I'm not sure um, if or when it will happen, but that's something we are looking into. Um, when it's presented as into our hurdles, 
Um, uh, you know, there, there are many hurdles depending on, I think, the restaurant. The restaurant may say, well, how can I afford to, to have heating or can heating happen or uh, right. what, are the, what are the requirements right. electrical? Are, what are yes, the, what are, I mean, all these things are, you know. Those are questions for restaurants to figure out. They're big boys and girls. They're, they're trying to make these decisions, but they can't yeah. make the decision if you don't give them the opportunity to make that decision, right? Yeah. The way you give them that opportunity is by opening the door. And what I'm hearing from you right now today is the door is closed. Um, so that, that choice that you're making by closing the door has consequences. It's not a just passive choice. It's an active choice by the administration to not make a decision today. And it means that restaurants today are making their decisions based on your choice to say no. So at least, you know, spare them the grief of not having information by fishing or cutting bait, just say no or say, we're thinking about it. We're going to have a decision in a week. I mean, these are real, these are business people who are trying to figure out what to do with our residents who work there, their own businesses. And it just feels a little cavalier to me um, and uh, very disheartening for the restaurant industry, which, you know, as the chair has said, you know, has just been clobbered. So uh, it, I think it's important to the public for the purpose of this hearing to give a date certain where you can say something rather than nothing. Can you do that? No, I, I, um... I cannot give you a date as to a decision, uh, when a decision is made, ultimately. Um, is it on the desk for the mayor to consider now? Is it in his consideration or has it not made it to his desk yet? Well, I think it's reworked work through the process. Um, I don't, I can't confirm if it's a, a part of decision yet. Um, Have you spoken The mayor, about when he announced, uh, absolutely we have discussions around this issue um the challenge i think is uh when the mayor actually announced this extension which by the way um you know i believe gives the certainty to the industry uh, up to october 31st which they did not have before and additional certainty about next year how that this program will be there um i think right now we think we're talking about as you mentioned winter which is uh the winter months what will happen um, and the mayor had said uh, that we will get back to the public on that decision. And that, uh, council member, I hear your, your concern, but that's where we are right now. And I, I really don't have any- Right now, are you discussing it that. with a deputy mayor in particular or the mayor himself? And what sorry, commissioners are involved in the discussion? I'm sorry, I didn't- you, you went in and out, I'm sorry. The discussion that's happening now about extending it beyond October 31st, is that discussion, what other commissioners are part of the discussion? And um, is it is a deputy mayor part of that discussion? Which deputy mayor? So as you know, uh, several agencies are involved in this program, which by the way, I want to keep saying is one of our real successful programs in which we're excited about um, and that we support 9,500 businesses are in it. And so, I mean, I, I think I wanna just clarify and make sure that uh, everyone listening and watching this understand the city's um, adjustments that we've made because this is a crisis and we're in a crisis and we've done that. Um, this is just a decision that we need to walk through. DOT, of course, obviously is part of that because of the street, uh, issue, DSNY for the sanitation, my office and agency, um, we're all having discussion and our respective deputy mayors are a part of that discussion as well, uh, just as how the process works. Which deputy mayors? Uh, 
all the all all the deputy mayors that these our agencies report to. So you have uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, Deputy Mayor Anglin, uh, Bean. All of us are you know the the entire administration is committed to this and in making sure that it works. I mean, this is these are ongoing discussions that are, that are happening. Um, you know, I we just don't have. I just I I understand what what your concerns are. I just I just do not have a date certain yes or no at the moment. And as soon as we have that, we will get it to the public. We understand, you know, the need for that and, um, you know, and that certainty. Um, but the mayor has given the certainty to October 31st and the certainty that by next year, uh, the program will come back. And we've heard from uh, the industry that, you know, they're very appreciative of that. I think the winter issue is one that is ongoing. I mean, to be clear, the industry is appreciative of crumbs. So um, this is an industry that, you know, is tanking. And I think the fact that you've been able to extend it one month is something. So today we're at, you know, August 13th, which um, by the way, is black women's equal pay day. Right, it takes one year, eight months and 13 days for a black woman to make as much as a man does in an annual in one year, right? So I'm asking because for, for restaurateurs like Melba, I'm asking for the restaurateurs who are hanging on by their fingernails and could appreciate more than two months notice about whether or not they need to buy, they have an opportunity to buy space heaters. And frankly, it would be nice if you could not only give them notice, but say whether or not the city will pay for space heaters. I understand that the federal government is screwing us over hand over fist. I understand that Trump could give a wit about New York City and wants to see it fail. I understand the federal government owes us tens of billions of dollars. But what I'm asking about is what the city can do with its rules and regulations to help in some tiny fractional way our restaurants survive. And this is such a tiny de minimis thing that I would hope that the city really is working 24 seven to make this decision. And if it is working 24 seven, I hope it, it'll make its decision prior to a month before or even two months before the date would begin. It's dispiriting to hear this. Um, I'll turn it back to the All chair. Right. Anything else you wanna say, yeah. commissioner, of course. Um, Will you answer that question, Commissioner Council Member? I want to add to your point, and it's an incredibly important point. The fire department will not authorize uh, propane heaters. They will not authorize or approve electric heaters. The only method that is approved today for fire department compliance is piped gas. Now imagine what the cost would be and the hurdles that we're referring to, to have gas piping expanded to outdoor dining to give temporary heat. And commissioner, this question is directed toward you. That's the law and thank you. I wanna thank the uh, person that sent that to me. I wasn't aware of it. So before we start talking about winter, it means the city coming together. And if we can't get you to meet with the mayor directly, because leadership starts at the top and up from the top, it trickles down to have the other commissioners come up with a real plan. So our small businesses can adapt and plan ahead. And Con Edison is not going to be there to allow the permitting process, the increasing gas lines, the increasing gas meters. We need them to waive this requirement. This is easily done, but it's going to require a decision, and that starts with the mayor. And Council Member Rosenthal, you hit an incredible point. The commissioner did not answer that question. I hope he'll answer. When was the last time he actually met with the mayor on this? 
how often is he meeting with the mayor? Because the mayor is the one that's going to be able to have the deputy mayors and the commissioners of the various agencies and departments pull their weight as we come across this. And Commissioner, please. Yeah, certainly. Um, as the Commissioner of Small Business Services, I'm in constant communication with the mayor. We meet and talk very frequently. This week we did, as you know, uh, announcement with the CLA program. Uh, before that, the other week, another program. And we're, so the, 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 the notion that we're not in communication, that's not, that's not true. We're, I'm in constant communication with the mayor. Uh, several meetings, ongoing, uh, coming up with decisions, uh, decision meetings, uh, brainstorming meetings, uh, phone calls, et cetera. Uh, you know, this is, we understand the challenges that the small business are facing, as you know, uh, and my job is to work with the mayor to come up with those solutions. And I hear you all on the urgency of this matter. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the mayor did extend it. He did say it's coming back next year. Um, and, you know, we were just in Chinatown uh, the, uh, two days ago, um, meeting with business owners with the mayor on these same issues. And, you know, again, so it, I think um, we want to make sure that everybody understands that the mayor's commitment here uh, to resolving this issue and what we have done so far. Um, and I think this is another challenge that we are looking at and, uh, you know, certainly we'll be reporting back out on those decisions. But I, I want everyone to be rest assured that we are uh, actively uh, looking into this, the mayor and deputy mayors yeah. and agencies. I'm That's gonna turn it reality. back to the chair, but this is just my last question, that the chair brought up a very specific issue of uh, the specific mechanism for outdoor heating. And it's uh, a challenge. And I, I wish you would have mentioned it as specifically as the chair just did as you were enumerating the specific challenges for making this decision. You know, this notion of propane gas, pipe gas, electric heaters, that's a very serious, but very specific, very specific issue. And I think when, you know, the public wants to know, what are you working on? Hearing those very specific, very real concerns helps give the public confidence that this is exactly what you're working on and saying, well, the issues around winter just isn't good enough. But I'm interested to hear about this specific issue of the type of heating mechanism. And I look forward to hearing back from you about what you can do to make it easier for restaurateurs and perhaps um, Andrew Ridgey can speak to that when he testifies. But I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all you're doing to help our small businesses during what is um, you know, the biggest crisis of our, of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, council member um, and, and commissioner. I know that it looks like perhaps we're beating on you on this and there's Many of these things don't fall um, uh, in, uh, or give you, you have the responsibilities or the capabilities to address them, but these are real issues. And while we talk about October 31st, the reopening of the sidewalk uh, street uh, restaurant uh, cafes will not occur back until May, that's six months. How are these businesses going to survive? Six months after having six months of no business. In essence, we're telling our small businesses, raise your hand, Don't not only don't pay rent, but don't pay your taxes and walk away and take your business to Westchester where you can operate or leave the, sit, the state altogether and go somewhere else. This is our problem to address and we're not doing it. When we say we understand, we really don't. Because none of many of us don't come from small business world. Many of us don't understand because we haven't been there. So um, we should be more mindful on how we address this and what it's actually going to mean uh, at the end. This city will never be the same 
and it's because of the failure of leadership that we have to really make commitments to helping out our small businesses. Uh, I'll hand it back to uh, the Sergeant in Arms to continue going on the roster on the other council members. Thank you, Chair Jonai um, and Councilmember Rosenthal. We'll now hear from Councilmember Rodriguez, followed by Councilmember Levin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. As someone that I've been at the Council from since 2009, I got to say that there's a lot that we have accomplished in this administration. Uh, I know that uh, with the leadership with Mayor de Blasio and other commissioners, we have seen a reduction of 100 million dollars in fine to local small businesses. So of course, as New Yorkers, it is a responsibility to always advocate for more. And I think that one of the basic concern and complaint and, and reality that we deal with is that even though most of the jobs are created by the map and pop, a, a small business owner, they don't get enough subsidy. They don't get enough financial support. And, and even though we discussed during the, the negotiation, the governor and the mayor, and especially the governor with Amazon, giving them $3 billion of incentive, no one has put together a plan to say, let's put together like a $1 billion of incentive to the local small businesses, even though they're getting two or three year plan. So has the city start any brainstorm on how to put together a plan that is more than connected a small businesses with the bank? Because as you know, like, you know, the black and Latino in the immigrant community that own most of the small businesses, you know that when we connected with the banks, most of them, they don't qualify. Most of them, they don't have the credit. Most of them, they don't have all the requirements to get those loans. So even though I know that the spirit is to help them, most of the time it doesn't go from more than yes, connecting them with information. So is a city right now discussing any plan to put together a permanent subsidy when it comes to a waiver of the property taxes for the small businesses so that the property owner, they don't pass the taxes to them or other initiatives. Thank you, council member. And uh, you know, you, you, you hit on, on a very uh, near and dear topic to myself uh, as a small business owner uh, going for a business loan and being denied um, and having to go to a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution uh, to get my first business loan. So I, I certainly understand all the challenges that our uh, black and brown businesses in particular are facing and that CDFIs uh, or our smaller lending institutions are the way to that. I think um, that's part of the process. And our work at SBS, as you mentioned, uh, um, it is to connect folks. But again, I want to just uh, say what that connection is. It's not a, a passing a, a, a uh, applicant onto a financial institution and then forgetting about them. No, we are there with them all the way through the process to make sure that they get what they're seeking. And so I think we want to clarify that process to make sure folks understand that um, we get to where the actual resources are and wherever those resources, we make sure that they're getting it. Um, we package those, uh, those proposals and those, uh, those deals um, for them to make sure that we can help them in that process. Um, but on, the, on a grander scale of, of incentives, uh, you know, most of our incentives um, are state driven, as you know, um, those incentives, uh, incentive programs, uh, most of them are from the state. We have talked to uh, our colleagues there about what can be done for small businesses. Um, that, you know, I know they're thinking about that. Um, also the city, I mean, we have our comprehensive plan uh, based on the resources that we currently have to address those needs. So uh, the, 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 broader, the broader question around incentive programs, uh, those are state authorized and um, change of taxes and all these other things, all these things we've sort of, um, you know, began to look at. And, and I know others are looking at at the state level as to what the city can have or what we can't have. But right now, the big thing that we do need uh, is long-term borrowing uh, for the city. And if we can get that I think a lot of the resources uh, that we're seeking, uh, we will be able to uh, to have uh, to help our small businesses uh, with our nine billion dollar deficit right now. 
I, I just hope that we can find a way of how to, you know, be creative on, 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 you know, during this moment of crisis. You know, yeah. one of the things that I heard by a very successful person back in the Dominican Republic when I was born and raised is that from crisis, we get opportunity. Absolutely. And I think we have, as we have to, as a city built by immigrants, and of course, being entrepreneur is in our DNA as the immigrants. Absolutely. I gotta say, as Dominican, we know, and anyone who is not Dominican, look, Google it to see the first non-Native American who served in New York City, Juan Joan Rodriguez, who was brought by the Dutch in 1613, left here in the island. And when the European came back years after, he was doing business with the Native American. So I think that, you know, our reality is that even though there's a different type of small business, there's one who might have been part of that is a lawyer who might have been the grandfather, their business owner, and they try to, to extract something new. For many of the immigrant and small business owner, is the first opportunity to get the dream to move to the middle class. And I think that at this moment, we need to be creative. I hope that under your leadership and the mayor, we need to put a plan that should be more than business as usual. Because big yeah. banks, they are not there. Like in my community, in Northern Manhattan, we have other banks, they come with a community benefit and they always try to get away with how do anything more than help your small business. So I think at this moment, and I don't know, you know, what is the legacy that you will leave to say, we push the big bank to give more than what they have done to help financially support the small businesses. And, and, and then I, I moved out to my second thing, which is what else can we do? And as you know, well, I have a bill at the city council with 28 council members supporting it, the Small Business and Jazz Survival Act. When Major de Blasio was a council member, he supported the bill that will bring fairness and right to a small business to negotiate and renew the leases. One of the things that I've been doing after the coronavirus, because I know that this is one particular way of how we can help the small business for them to retain the leases, is that I gave new language to the council so that the bill will only be in effect out, outside the center of Manhattan. So I would like to follow with you and the rest of your team so that in, in, in the administration, because I think that if we can find a way of how to bring fairness and pass the Small Business Just Survival Act, then I feel that there's gonna be an additional thing that we can do, very specific, so that we can stop you know, the closure of so many mom and pop store that is happening right now, and 100,000 or more that will happen if we don't take action. Yeah, so no, will, you be, will you be open to, you know, have this question? I don't want to put you in a spot saying, will you support it, yes or no? I know what the administration has done, but I think I would like to open a mechanism of discussion so that we can share the new language of the bill. Yeah, absolutely. You know, council member, as you know, you know, we're, we're always open to discussion. I think um, one of my core principles of running this agency is, is around collaboration and figuring out ways that we can help solve these real issues uh, that our small businesses are facing. Collaboration is key. Uh, without it, uh, we, we cannot, we cannot uh, accomplish anything at this particular moment. And so um, I'm, I'm happy to, to continue those discussions with you, sir, and, and look to new ideas and things that we are thinking about. And we are also talking to private industry and nonprofits and philanthropy on a consistent basis about how we all uh, can collaboratively come together and think outside the box um, and to make sure that we're solving these real, real uh, issues that our small businesses are facing. So, so I absolutely look forward to your discussing with you. Thank you, Commissioner. My last thing is related to what, as you know, the 181st uh, Business Improvement District uh, do a, a great job. Uh, currently, they've been using a, a 360 grant uh, by the SBS that allow them to do a great job supporting the small businesses. Uh, I appreciate that you were, you had a tour. I couldn't be there. I was in DR with my two daughters. Uh, but as you know, 181st is going, I'm talking 181st in Manhattan, between Amsterdam and Broadway is going through a major development. A $350 million new construction at the corners with a hotel, 170,000 square feet for community space. 
and a new mall coming to 181st and Broadway. So if you, again, can look at that particular grant that SBS has been providing to the 181st beat and, and, and explore the opportunity to continue supporting that, that, that base so that they can support the small businesses there. And at the same time, as construction of, the, of that building at 181st and Amsterdam will be done by the end and by 2021, if SBS or city agency can explore to take a floor in that building, to provide, to turn it as an incubators, to support the local small business. Because one thing that is happening is the case of many out of world communities that we lacking, you know, places where they, it's not that they cannot go to downtown and get a training or to 125th. But if you can, and more than happen to follow with you and your team, to look at the possibility, what is there from City Hall that we can look at the possibility to see if there's any opportunity for the, the city to take a flow in, in one of the new construction going on there to provide training to and provide support to the local small businesses on Northern Manhattan in the Bronx. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, that's a great idea. I, I, maybe we'll uh, happy to set something up to discuss that uh, new project. Um, on on our on our end, um, you know, the we went through the budget process and certainly are working um, on our grants now to to try to get as many of them out the door as possible. So uh, we'll circle back on the status and where those are um, to to let you know. Uh, uh, where, where we are with those uh, with those particular grants um, in our uh, business corridors. Thank you, Commissioner. What about SB? What about the liquid uh, SLA? And as you know, SLA consult with many city agency can be with you in the NYPD at the local present. But don't you think that we need to centralize it because of the moment where we are right now? Where it could be you or any agency to be the one that we are. As a council, we know that this particular agency is like the liaison between the city and the liquor license so that we can address those issues that have negative impact in the local restaurants throughout the five boroughs. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it, there's, you know, there's direct communication with, with the mayor's, with the, uh, the mayor's office um, and the state on SLA, with SLA uh, in particular. So, um, we're certainly happy to, happy to connect you um, with the folks who are uh, having those specific discussions um, on, on all the state issues. As you can imagine, we do have our state office that deals with all of our state issues, and this is part of their portfolio as well. Um, but, but happy to connect you with, with those colleagues. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I just want to thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. You made some great points. Commissioner, um, as a follow-up to Com Council Member Rodriguez's question, has the city waived the commercial rent tax that's imposed in businesses in Manhattan during the pandemic and this crisis? My understanding, the city has not waived that tax. So let me get this straight. Businesses that are suffering during this pandemic and crisis are paying an excess tax because they're located in Manhattan and they have no business. Is that correct? Uh, my understanding is, is that that tax is, uh, has, was not waived um, as of so now. What we're doing then is we're actually shutting them down. And then yet we say, and it's great that we say we're working with philanthropy, our financial institutions, we're doing all of this great work to reach out and help our small businesses, Commissioner. But our small businesses don't pay taxes to commercial banks or philanthropy. They pay taxes to New York City. And again, New York City, instead of being there to help them, we want to make sure that we put the final nail into their coffin. All those businesses that are listening right now are going to walk away saying, the city of New York is the problem. And we're allowing them to close down and relocate if they even, even can relocate. And it's because of our own actions or our inactions. And I hope when you go back, uh, and I know that all of this is directed toward you, when you go back and meet with the mayor, 
point by point. These things have to be addressed. I mean, he may have a little over a year left in his administration, but that year requires him to pay attention to the businesses and be the leader that he must be. And a small business uh, commissioner, it's up to you to deliver those messages and come back with real relief and solutions and answers to these problems. You want to continue, um, Sergeant Arms? I'm sorry, please answer, Commissioner. No, it's just gonna, I was going to say, absolutely, we'll get back to you. I know um, on the commercial rent taxes, yes, it's in place. I mean, the fees and penalties have been waived. Um, et cetera, because of the outbreak. But I hear your point, sir, and, and I certainly uh, uh, will, will circle back with you on that particular issue. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Joe and I. We will next hear from Council Member Levin. As a reminder to any Council Members who still wish to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order that you raised your hand. Chair Levin, you may begin. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, I want to appreciate, I want to let you know how much I appreciate you being here today and the work that you um, continue to do on behalf of small businesses um, in the city um, who are all struggling in, in uh, ways that were, were, were incomprehensible um, um, before the pandemic. Um, I, I spoke to a small business owner this morning um, who is has three stores and is closing two of them um, in in my district, and um, the 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 issue that that he wrote, raised to me is that um, the the lease payments are as even when they are. Um, even when uh, you know if, if it's personal liability, or um, even if we're able to um, uh, extend out the time in which uh, a an owner or a business owner can can make their lease payments, um, those lease payments are still eventually due. But that was entirely those, those lease the lease contract is entirely um, based upon uh, businesses being able to have cash flow being able to to take in business how how are we looking at the real issue is rent relief and so how can how can we do that how are we looking at our jurisdiction as a city um are there state proposals that we would get behind um you know obviously we can't really count on the federal government for much these days. And I think it would be a mistake. It would be at our own peril to assume that they could do something or that they would do something. But um, in our own house in New York City and New York State, what do you see as possibilities? Um, and what are some of the limitations? What are some of the hurdles that we would have to overcome? Legal limitations? Um, financial limitations. Um, how are you looking at this big picture? Because eventually, um, you know, these, these um, businesses have just, you know, they're looking at an immense uh, personal liability issue after, after the, uh, the personal liability um, uh, waiver that we put into place expires. Um, and hopefully, I mean, the one other question would be, how long do you think that we can extend that for legally? Um, so those are a couple of questions I'd, I'd love your opinion on. Thank you, council member. Um, you know, I, I think you raise uh, a significant question around rent um, and, and what, what, is, what are we doing? Um, obviously for us, um, the challenge is uh, resources to actually have some sort of um, direct support or cash support uh, to our small businesses. Um, we just don't we just don't have the funding. I think um, along the lines of things that can be explored if we are given a stimulus and or if Albany uh, grants the city the ability to do long term borrowing. Um, I think you know we can address or begin to look at addressing some of these challenges. Um, in that market, 
Um, so what we have is that we support, of course, um, helping our small businesses with the legal challenges, as you, as you know, as mentioned before, with our programs, uh, making sure that at least they have a representation from lawyers, they can actually negotiate. But yes, uh, we are cognizant and it's real, right? The, the rent will come due at some point. Um, and if we're not able to get the economy moving at the a rate that will make sure that those business owners have the ability to repay, I think the challenge will continue. Um, so yeah, you know, we are, I know our uh, colleagues are, are speaking with the state constantly about these. I know our colleagues in Washington are also speaking uh, to the folks uh, on the Hill there concerning uh, what can be done specifically around these issues. And so we're, we're definitely looking at that. I think one thing that we did push for um, and that we did get uh, some relief in, and we see that there's a new initiative and some uh, new um, uh, energy around doing more was around the PPP program and increasing the overhead uh, allowable uh, expenses from 15%, um, 25%, uh, sorry, 40%. Um, and so we are, that was helpful because it was able to get some small businesses the opportunity um, to add uh, some additional dollars out of that overhead expense to rent um, and utilities, which was important for our New York City businesses. And so um, I believe there there is some talk about uh, re-upping that program again, extending it out and doing another phase of the program. It was $130 billion left in the program uh, um, unclaimed uh, and some new uh, proposals, both from the, uh, from the House of Representatives and the Senate also addresses like what can be done with those dollars. Uh, and, and of course on there is one getting the ability to get uh, an additional uh, loan, but also uh, you know, making sure that that uh, split between, um, you know, employee retention and employees and also overhead um, stays uh, really balanced based upon our uh, needs here in the city. And so we've been advocating for those policies um, as they roll them out. And then ultimately we would help connect those specific businesses to those opportunities. So um, in short, yes, we are looking at all things. We are speaking with our folks both in Albany here. Uh, the mayor's convened, um, you know, the uh, sector advisory councils. These are issues that are come up on a small business committee and other committees as well uh, that we are thinking through uh, what's the best way to do that. But uh, short of direct cash assistment, assistance, um, I, I think that which we obviously don't have uh, as a city, um, we have to go where the funds are. And so that's where a lot of the activity has been around. Um, uh, with regard to that, the personal liability <clears throat> waiver that's due to expire, um, do you, uh, has like council at SBS looked at this to see how, whether there's a kind of time limit that puts it into a legal gray area? Yeah, I know I, I know our teams are, um, reviewing this particular uh, provision as well. Um, and, and we'll cir circle back on when, you know, around that time, but certainly this is um, right now, everything is on the table. And we're looking at all these provisions and making sure that we are within the legal framework of what we can do. Um, as you know, as certain, um, uh, you know, challenges are there. Um, but we are looking at it all um, and making sure that we are at least aligned um, with, with our small businesses, with the administration, our, our department uh, to get to where we need to be um, as it pertains to relief for these small businesses. So, so we're certainly um, looking at that. I think there's, I think it's, I think it's um, a Great Britain that's doing a, that they with small businesses have I think the government is pitching in a third, the tenant pitches in a third, and the landlord pitches in a third to make up for uh, the rent. Um, I mean, is that a concept that uh, that could make sense so that obviously we wouldn't, you know, as a city, we don't have the ability to pay everybody's rent, but um, if there's an arrangement where it could be reached between the city, the, the landlord, and the tenant, 
um, during during the emergency uh, period. Um, is that is that a, the kind of thing that might might be a workable idea? Uh, look, I, I uh, if we again, I think that the the lack of funds, um, you know, is really a, a challenge for us um, when we're thinking about where we can find solutions that require funds. And so this is one of them uh, that's happening there, um, but they've been able to find the, the, the resources um, on a national scale to do so. And that's again, going back to our federal government as a solution as Britain and other countries are actually their federal government or their national government is the one leading the way. And I think that's mm -hmm. our challenge here. Our localities cannot afford this and, um, and, and they're not able to, to meet that challenge, uh, but the federal governments around the world are doing it. And, um, you know, our federal government is not. And so that is, I think, quintessential part of the issue that we're dealing with right now. Um, and why we see such a difference in how the response has been uh, across, uh, you know, from country to country. Um, so it sounds great, but you know, again, that's a that's essentially a federal response. Um, and and then given the aid to the city in order to continue that work, um, and we, we we're not getting that from our federal government. So uh, that that all sounds no. enticing. Certainly, if we can get it. Um, I'm sure we'll be exploring all, all options right now. Yeah. Um, no, I remember having a conversation with our congressional delegation in April, and they assured us that the next round of stimulus was going to be arriving in mid-May. Mm. It's now mid-August. Mid-August. And I just read a report that said that the president says it's just not going to happen now. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, we, we feel very... Uh, we feel absolutely abandoned by the federal government right now here in New York City. Um, and um, they have the ability to, um, uh, to, 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 to run a deficit and to borrow and to um, print money and we don't. Um, and um, we need help. Small businesses need help in the city and we need help from the federal government. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member Levin. I'll now turn it back to Chair Jonai. Thank you, Councilman Levin. And uh, you, we, you hit on a couple of great points, especially when it comes to rent. And we know that that's a uh, huge burden for our small businesses. Um, and the personal liability is one that uh, uh, many of our small businesses are struggling with. But asking landlords to do their part while government is not willing to remove their own liabilities because if the sales tax is not paid, it becomes a personal liability on our small businesses owner, our small business owners. If real estate taxes are not paid, they become a liability through a lien on those properties. And if any taxes are not paid, they become a direct lien that that small business is responsible for. So we can't ask an industry to do one or comply while we don't hold ourselves accountable to the same standard. Government is supposed to lead. Government should lead. We have the ability to do so in the resources. If we're not willing to do our part or what we ask private industries to do, then we have no right to ask them to do anything more than government is willing and capable of doing. And I keep hitting back on this. Before we ask private industry to do more, we need to do more. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Mr. Klaassen has been very uh, patient and I thank you because I have some questions for you. But Commissioner, I think we all understand what's at stake and it's the future of New York City. Every small business that does not reopen any one of those 230,000 businesses that do not reopen will lead to a net loss to our city, whether it be through employment or taxes or through a service or a product that they offer that makes our city so great. Each one of them is detrimental and important to our future. And if we just translate it into something as simple as the smartest investment that we can make 
today into coming, into making sure New York City remains vibrant is by investing in small business today. Instantly, it will yield a return on our investment. Maybe this is a foreign language to electives and we don't understand perhaps what it means to get a return on our investment. Every dollar that we put into small business will yield a return on our investment today, not tomorrow. Um, if it's okay, uh, Mr. Klosner, I want to direct some of the questions uh, toward you. You mentioned that not all of the platforms have been completely compliant with the fee cap. You feel that the steps OSE has taken uh, have, have been sufficient to stop the illegal activity if you have not issued fines and have the platforms change their actions from your current enforcement model? Thank you for the question. The, you know, the way the law is written, um, and, and we're really glad to see these changes made after the last hearing, was to create an enforcement mechanism where the Corporation Council is authorized to bring an injunctive action and to seek all the remedies involved, including restitution. Um, so I think you know, the, the point is that whatever money is illegally charged to a restaurant can be returned to the restaurant, um, whereas a fine to the company would not do that. Um, that is the specific goal of our enforcement is to have as light a touch on the industry as possible, on the restaurant industry as possible while returning the maximum amount of revenue back to the restaurants. Um, I, I really, you know, I don't want to speak too far out of turn. Um, the, the company that we discovered with the um, potentially charging 10% for a pickup, um, they, have, they have preliminarily committed to refunding all of the instances in which that's happened. Um, and to looking into how it happened and making sure that it, they're in compliance with the law. So I'm very confident that um, that, that will yield a, a positive benefit. And I do think that that is the most effective way to enforce. I, I mean, the reality is that Oath shut down for months. Um, and so trying to set up a system where the city um, spends enforcement resources on writing thousand, $1,000 fines per day per restaurant um, would end up costing the city much, much more money and ultimately be less effective because it would be focused on, on violations on a per restaurant basis instead of a citywide enforcement basis, right? We're, we're being very clever in how we're um, being efficient in our resource deployment and trying to get relief for the industries, for the restaurants industry-wide and not on a restaurant by restaurant basis. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. I thought the law that we've passed does both, uh, forces the companies to return the money to the restaurant while also being subjected to fines and penalties that are imposed. And in our immediate focus is on getting compliance. If it, where, we've seen, where we've seen good faith efforts and where we've seen compliance in other areas, then our presumption is that perhaps, you know, A, is this actually happening? Is this position of the company? Uh, B, are they going to continue? If they're going to continue, uh, I'm sorry, if they're going to come into compliance and they're going to return the money to the restaurants, um, then, you know, at that point, I, I, I don't think it is in the city's best interest to then do exhaustive um, analysis and, you know, start doing further investigation on how many times it has happened, right? The, the goal is to have the money go back to the restaurants. I agree with you and I love the model. I wish we would apply that universally across all our agencies and departments because sanitation is out there writing tickets now to property owners for dirty sidewalks, a $50 ticket. And you're talking about a thousand dollar fine per incident. They're out there aggressively now ticketing cars for 50 bucks to fine, issuing violations for minor things such as dirty sidewalks and a piece of paper that may have blown in front of their storefront. But yet we're not willing to go after bad actors in that intentionally break the law, that know the requirements, know the penalty. They have endless resources and attorneys that have translated the laws and their requirements. But yet we have a double standard when it comes to small businesses and property owners. 
that $50 ticket is worth it when a $1,000 ticket per incident is not worth it. I'm a bit disheartened by that approach, unless we're going to apply that across the board, because I know plenty of small businesses that would love the opportunity to correct their conditions without paying any fines. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm happy to speak to that. I think one of the things that's unique about um, about this legislation is it focuses, focuses on an industry where there's relatively few um, entities in the universe of regulated entities, right? There's, there's really only six companies that we know of active in New York City. Um, and so, you know, we're seeking to hold that company accountable for its actions, uh, regardless of where those actions occur. So, I, I mean, even in the, in the sanitation, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm certainly not gonna speak for sanitation, but in those cases, there's one place that owns that piece of sidewalk. If there was one company that owned the sidewalk in front of every restaurant in the city, then obviously you would want sanitation to issue the fine to that company. That's not the case. So I, it's a little bit apples to oranges. I, I don't know if that, you know, you were actually trying to draw a one-to-one -one comparison, um, but I appreciate the, you know, I, I appreciate your kind words that we've adopted, you know, that we've, we've pivoted. We stood up very quickly, a efficient and lean enforcement mechanism. Um, that didn't require, uh, fortunately, um, it required us to reshuffle some priorities, but didn't require any additional resources on the city's part. Um, and, you know, and let me just say, right, where, where our investigation concludes that the companies um, are not willing to come into compliance, um, you know, if we're forced to take a company to court, by all means, we'll be seeking, you know, we'll be seeking fines up to $1,000. Um, you know, but where we can get immediate compliance and get the money back to the restaurants, that's our, that's our primary goal. I agree with you, getting the money back to the restaurants, but uh, I'm looking for universal um, implementation of all of our laws, uh, whether it be a sanitation ticket or because they failed to put a quarter in a meter uh, or a license or a permit, there's always a consequence, um, which leads me to the next question. Uh, has the city invested any funds or re other resources than corporate counsel? Have they brought in additional attorneys to handle um, the necessary uh, enforcement of the laws or in the advertising the OSC's role in enforcing them? Um, if you're relying on your existing capabilities, and we know that corporate counsel is already um, dealing with more than its fair share and under the crisis and um, oath being uh, uh, closed and the methods by which uh, these court actions have been brought and addressed has been a tremendous workload. Have we invested any more money or resources into enforcement and into researching uh, for bad actors? I, I, we didn't need to. We The o OSC has, you know, I, I've... I've carved out a piece of, of my time, uh, which seems like I'm, I'm doing, you know, two and a half full-time jobs compared to one full-time job before. Um, we've, uh, you know, we've had attorneys reprioritize their caseloads. We have members of our research team working on this um, and providing support. Um, you know, like I said, if, if this were a different industry, if there were, you know, if there were a hundred different players, um, then the resource needs would have been much different. I think we, you know, we identified even prior to the previous law that um, that we could accomplish the goals of the legislation, that if the penalties were done right and if we had access to the courts for injunction and for restitution, that those would provide powerful incentives to the industry. And apparently it has, as we've reported, there's wide scale compliance um, and that, you know, we, we've seen very few uh, outreaches from restaurants claiming abuses or, or inaccurate or illegal activity. Um, so I, I think that we, we struck the right balance because we largely got compliance and we're, you know, we're engaged in a process where um, the two potential, um, potentially non-compliant companies are, are taking our demands seriously um, and working with us to resolve our concerns. Uh, thank you, Mr. Klosner. So that then opens up the question to, well, because you're doing two and a half jobs now, um, what languages have you made? Um, this public to our restaurants and the thousands of restaurants, and I don't know the exact number, but I'm sure uh, Robert Bookman will give us the number of, of restaurants and eateries that we have that are uh, participating in third-party delivery apps. How did you get this message across if you didn't have any funding? 
How did we inform all of these small businesses in different languages in a city of 8.6 million residents? Well, I, again, council member, the, the approach we've taken is that as soon as we are aware of any one action by any of the companies that would constitute an illegal overcharge, we're going to that company. It, it doesn't, you know, and I would say to the company, if they said, well, how many complaints have you gotten? I would say it doesn't matter, right? We know what the practice is. You tell us what you do. Tell that us if you're violating the law it, or not. I'm sorry. It does matter because it's per incident, $1,000 per incident per location. It really does and matter. If, and if we get to the point where we're pursuing penalties through litigation, um, then we'll get into that information with them. Again, our immediate goal is compliance. Compliance has been wide scale. Our secondary goal, and this is the most important, is making sure that the restaurants get the money back if they're illegally charged. I, I, and so we have not stood up um, and did not. You know, we we when this bill passed the first time, it was with the understanding there were no financial risk impacts. Um, and you know, and this came through your committee with that message that there were no fiscal impacts. So I. I I'm a, I'm a little confused. I think you know the answer to the question, which is that we haven't dedicated any resources. The bill passed under that understanding. Um, and the reality is we didn't need any additional resources. I, 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 you know, you mentioned Rob Bookman. I, I welcome to hear if the industry thinks that, that we can do more outreach or that there are, you know, that feels that we aren't receiving adequately uh, or don't have our ears open to the messages from restaurant owners. Um, you know, if, if there was an allegation that there was wide-scale non-compliance by any of these companies in, in um, communities that were targeting specifically business owners um, where English is not the primary language, I think that's when we would look at language access materials. But you know, from what we understand now, the, the companies are acting um, in compliance with the law and they're acting consistent across the board. And so that where we see a violation in any one restaurant, our assumption is that would be a violation anywhere and we're gonna hold them accountable for that. Yeah, but Mr. Klesner, and again, I, I, I'm going to harp on this for a moment. You're relying on complaints and allegations by restaurant owners to bring it to your attention. Unless you have access to the books of these companies to determine are the fees being charged appropriate and in compliance with the laws, you would not know unless someone brought it to your attention. And if they've done it to one restaurant and it's been alleged and a complaint has been filed, then it must be widespread. They, unless they've identified a single restaurant, which I would find very difficult to imagine, that has happened. And if that has happened, then they've targeted a local business, which is a whole other concern of mine. But you would not know unless you have access to their financial books and billing statements, and you don't have that time to review those. And if you're not doing that, you're relying on feedback. And then the question becomes, how did you get the word out to the tens of thousands of businesses individually in throughout the city in various languages, giving them the advice that they need to know on how to complain and bring complaints to your attention? If you found one instant or one incident by any one of these companies to any one restaurant, then the assumption has to be it's widespread. Yeah, I, I apologize, but I, I just I don't agree with the premise that what we need is that every affected business owner notify us when when the report of one business owner is sufficient to have the city spring into robust action and immediately contact the companies and hold them accountable and demand both explanation and restitution. I, I don't accept the premise that we needed 5,000 restaurant owners to take time out of their day trying to struggle, trying to stand up and maintain a business in this challenging environment to then engage with us, to then have a system where the city needs to uh, spend a lot more money to actually support that when it doesn't actually increase our chances of victory. It doesn't do as anything really to drive compliance. So I, I guess, you know, I mean, I'm happy to continue this conversation. And, and again, I'm, I'm listening to the whole hearing, right? I, I've been in touch with the Restaurant Alliance. They were our partners in putting out the tip line. Um, we've been checking with them to see what are you hearing in the industry, right? This is part of the outreach we did both before and after, and we're not hearing it. So I, I, I'm listening the whole hearing. If I hear any other business owner raising any issues, we'll be following up with them. Um, and I, you know, and, and I welcome correction by members of the restaurant industry that, um, that their concerns haven't been heard. If, uh, if they feel that, I'll be following up with them directly. 
Thank you, Mr. Klesner, but I, you're, I agree with you. The intent is to make sure that those restaurants uh, are reimbursed for any fees that they should not have been charged, and that's the idea. So if that means more resources to make sure that each restaurant uh, gets their money refunded, um, I'm with you. We're not looking to penalize anyone more than we have to, but it's about getting the word out, and I'll give it back to the committee council. I, I'm grateful to you for being willing to sit on this hearing and as we hear from the testimony, and who knows what will be revealed. And Commissioner, I'm not sure if you're going to be staying for the rest of the hearing, but I encourage you to do so as well. Thank you, Chair Thank you. I, you know, I do want to... Go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I, I have to jump off of this call, but our team is on, as you know, sir. We will be, be in touch. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. And, and I just to wanted to say, I, you know, I, I said I was... I attended the entire last hearing, and... You know, and it was the, you know, the words and, and quite an education of the business owners. And so it's, you know, I appreciate, I, I really am looking forward to hearing their questions and, and their testimony as well. And we find it critical to understanding from the business owner's perspective, um, enforcement and, and really what we stood up and what we designed was with their needs in mind, as well as the legislation's goals. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Jonai, Commissioner Doris, Executive Director Klosner. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Andrew Riggi to testify. And after Andrew Riggi, I call upon Robert Bookman and Josh Gold to testify afterwards. Mr. Riggi, you may begin your testimony. Time starts thank, now. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Riggi. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit trade association that represents uh, restaurants and nightlife establishments throughout the five boroughs. I want to thank the speaker who uh, spoke earlier, Chair Joe and I, Councilmember Moya, Richards, uh, Rosenthal, uh, Levin, Powers, uh, and several others who joined us um, today. So as you know, the city's restaurant industry has just been absolutely devastated. As it pertains to third-party delivery fees and other business practices, we all know that this was a crisis before the crisis we find ourselves in today. Um, passing the fee cap, as well as the bill that prohibits the uh, practice of charging bogus fees for phone call orders that never occurred were critically important. I have heard through restaurant from restaurant tours throughout the five boroughs uh, that are struggling just to survive. And they have told me over and over again, capping these fees helped them not only try to sustain their business throughout this process, but at least gave them a little bit of hope that the government was going to go in and help them as they have. But clearly from this discussion and others, there is so much more we need our federal, state and city government to do. Um, we must, we absolutely must continue the cap on these fees during the emergency. We are at a point where yes, indoor dining is incredibly helpful. I believe nearly 10,000 restaurants are now participating in it, but there's more than 25,000 eating and drinking establishments in the five boroughs. And it was never intended to help sustain businesses forever when they're not able to operate indoors. And as it is today, we still do not know when we will be able to start operating indoors, even though the rest of the state has under some almost the same health metrics. Uh, we thought we were gonna open up about a month ago. That clearly has not happened. We need a plan for indoor dining. And we need this bill to be passed to ensure that the fee cap is in place until we are at 100% occupancy for indoor dining. But we also need to look aggressively towards a permanent cap. Because as I mentioned, the fees and other business practices that were concerning the industry were a crisis before the crisis we find ourselves in. Um, and as the current bill is structured, you can, or a third party delivery company can charge two different fees. One for the actual transaction and another for the physical delivery of the food and beverage. Uh, generally speaking, I do want to give the city 
Um, props and commend them. They have been very responsive to any restaurateurs we have sent their way that have seen uh, or thought there was a violation. I do not think it is widespread. That's not to say that it hasn't happened, but I do know the city, in my experience, has Time been expired. responsive to those businesses. Um, if I can continue just for a, another moment, one problem I have heard is that although for the physical delivery cap, which is at 15%, there were some restaurants pre-pandemic that were only paying 10%. And these companies have now gone and increased their th actual delivery cap to 15%, which has been quite problematic. Um, they said the restaurant requested it when the restaurant did not request an increase. I don't know why they would increase request an increase. Um, as I mentioned before, we also need to ensure that they're not getting charged for these bogus fees. And because there are so many other topics touched on at today's hearing, I know my colleague Robert Bookman will speak next, and he can address some of the other reforms that are so desperately needed. But we must continue this fee. We must look towards a permanent one. We must ensure that businesses are not being uh, charged bogus fees. And we also need to review all the different regulations on the books, look where we can implement reforms, what we can do to get these restaurants a plan for reopening indoors safely. And also, I want to speak to Council Member Richard's uh, legislation as well. It is, of course, incredibly, incredibly important that we ensure any funding from any level of government or from any private entity, for that matter, is being given out in an equitable manner to small businesses throughout the five boroughs. We know all types of these businesses have been hit hard, but particularly those small restaurants in immigrant and uh, communities of color have been hit even harder because of all the systemic issues that have impacted these communities for way too long. So we need to ensure that uh, they are done equitably. We need to ensure that we focus on these issues and like I said before, our restaurant industry is the backbone of our community, and we need to ensure that we have policies in place so there is a fair and equitable regulatory environment with third-party companies. It's good to see some of them have stepped up to the plate and enacted policies to really try to help these businesses, but we need to ensure these regulations are in place because as we've seen from the past, we can't rely on them voluntarily implementing these programs to help our businesses. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And I mentioned earlier, my colleague Rob Bookman will follow me. Uh, we'll make some additional points in this year to answer some questions as well. But I wanna thank you uh, for your consideration of our comments and we urge you to swiftly pass and enact these bills into law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riggi. Unless there are any questions from the members, we will move on to the next panelist. Seeing no additional questions from the members, we'll move on to Robert Bookman, followed by Josh Gold, and then Evan Franca. Mr. Bookman, you may begin your testimony. Your time starts now. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanna start off by saying the council has done more uh, since this crisis to help our industry, the restaurant industry, than the state and the federal government combined. And we want to thank you for that. Uh, when we originally passed Local Law 51 and 52, the September 30th date was chosen because it seemed like a light year away. Surely we would be back to something that reflected normalcy by then. We now know it's not the case. Uh, we need to extend uh, the deadline on these bills until restaurants uh, can operate under normal circumstances, which means 100% capacity. Uh, so these bills have been critically important. They're a lifeline and, and, and they must continue. Uh, since this turned into, and I, I, and I also wanna say that uh, Executive Director Kloster and his office has really been an excellent partner. The bills have worked. Um, there has been widespread compliance. Um, perhaps a little kicking and screaming from one particular company, but they've been complying. He's been in regular contact with the hospitality lines and with me personally, and uh, he's, a, he's an excellent partner. And we'll, we look forward to continue to working together on the, on the expansion of this bill. And then we, we need to work together to look like what the permanent cap will look like. It doesn't necessarily have to uh, match the language of this one, but we need to start working on, on a permanent one. Since this hearing, if you will, Mr. Chairman, give me a couple of minutes, turned into a little bit of an oversight and, and the, uh, 
speaker himself asked what could be done. I've take, taken a few little notes and I want to briefly go through a few items that can be done by the council and by the city right now. Um, the first is uh, pass intro 823 from 2018. There was a hearing on it two years ago. It allows even before COVID, it's even more important now, it'll, it allows our industry to do what the rest of the state can do and have clearly disclosed surcharges on our menus. Um, we need to stop the discrimination against New York City restaurants with laws that apply to the rest only here in New York City and not the rest of the state. Uh, the most important one being, when are we going to allow our New York City restaurants to open up indoors? Uh, it is now uh, five weeks since we were supposed to. It is six or seven weeks since the rest of the state has done so. Uh, they've done it safely without any problems. Uh, we need the mayor and the council to use its bully pulpit and stand up to the governor uh, and say, what are the metrics? When will we be, when will a restaurant in the Bronx uh, have the same rights as a restaurant in, in White Plains? Uh, it's just ludicrous. It's starting to look a little bit more like peak rather than science. And we need to get some answers here. Uh, next thing that clearly could be done is eliminate uh, the New York City tax on state liquor licenses. It's not a big it's not a big amount, but it's another thing that we are discriminated against. We get taxed in New York City on the privilege of holding a state liquor license that we pay double what they pay for in the rest of the state. Uh, next, end the commercial rent tax, a discrimination against commercial storefronts in a portion of the city. Uh, next, expand outdoor dining uh, to contiguous next door spaces that are vacant or that the uh, next door uh, buildings have no objection to. There's no reason why we should not be able to do that immediately. Uh, there's no legal reasons and that would add more sidewalk space uh, that is not being used now for restaurants. Uh, we also need to expand the winter dining and as was discussed, the way to do that and the main thing stopping that is heaters. It's nice that we're going to have this program again next year, but we are concerned that there will be very few restaurants around next spring unless we start doing a lot of these other things right now. Um, to quote from a recent article in Grub, in Grub Street, um, we are taken as a whole, it's hard to shake the feeling that we are now watching the collapse of the entire New York City hospitality industry in real time. And that's what we're talking about here. And last but not least, fines. Uh, a lot of numbers were thrown around here, but the truth of the matter is there's been nothing to reduce fines uh, since COVID. There's been nothing to reduce fees since COVID. From little sidewalk newsstands in Midtown that can't be open because there's no business and yet are still paying their annual license fees to the 20 some odd million dollars a year in health department fines uh, that were still being collected. Uh, we've got to go to a, a, you know, a, a situation where government's job is to educate first and find second. And uh, we are nowhere near there. There are still hundreds of millions of dollars in fines uh, that are collected against small business owners. We should be using this opportunity. It's not rocket science to go through the five or six agencies that regulate small businesses, see where they, where they find people and determine which of those can be education opportunities and warning opportunities. These are all quick things that could be done to stop discrimination against small businesses and restaurants in New York City. And the last thing I wanna say is parenthetically, when you discriminate against restaurants in New York City, for example, not allowing us to open when the rest of the state can open, you are discriminating against minority and women owned businesses. Because while I don't have the exact number, it's pretty safe to say anecdotally that the overwhelming majority of minority and women owned businesses in the state of New York are in New York City. And so the single biggest thing you can do to help those businesses is treat us the way the rest of the state gets treat, treated. Allow us to have this, you know, uh, surcharges, allow us to open inside and stop these ridiculous taxes on us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bookman. I'll now turn the floor over to Chair Jonai, followed by Chair uh, Council Member Powers for questions. My question to you, Robert and Andrew, thank you for your testimony and your patience. Um, how have you, how has the industry been informed uh, about the uh, caps? Um, have you had to do this or were they aware 
And are you still finding restaurants that are not aware of the caps? And then um, follow up to this, and either one of you, and Andrew, thank you. Um, are you aware of any restaurants that have been wrongfully charged a fee above the cap limits that we had or any of the other compliance issues? Um, thank you, Chair Joe and I. Uh, so the New York City Hospitality Alliance has an email distribution list that goes to 13, maybe 14,000 uh, people in the industry. Uh, so we have regularly communicated information about the cap and many of the different requirements uh, to the industry. Um, we have seen through a handful, and I apologize, I don't have the number at hand, um, of submissions from business owners who believe their third party delivery company was not uh, in compliance. However, as I think I mentioned earlier, the city did set up a uh, uh, email address where they had then communicated that information. I believe they had been very responsive um, as uh, my colleague Rob Bookman said earlier. So we've done it through our email, we've done it through social media. Uh, I cannot speak for the city of New York on what they have done, but we have been very active at least within our network to get that information out, uh, both via email, social media, uh, and through the press and other um, vehicles. Um, as far as the bogus fees, um, I did hear from a couple of restaurants early on who thought they may have received bogus fees. Um, they were following up, in this case, with Grubhub Seamless. They may have submitted it to the city as well, um, but when I did not hear back from them, and I would say maybe it was three of, you know, three of these complaints, um, you know, it's my understanding that they had had them resolved. Yeah, that, that, that tips was uh, hotline was really our idea and they immediately agreed and adopted it. Um, and uh, Christian has really been, you know, uh, hounding me on a regular basis, you know, to say, have you heard anything new? Have you heard anything new? And so we have really, you know, we're happy to report. Uh, they acted on anything that we got to them immediately. And uh, from what we could tell, uh, you know, they're making good progress. You know, they're acting, you know, the way I would explain it, Mr. Chairman, is that they're looking at it as kind of like a class action lawyer looks at stuff, you know. Um, if there's one, there may be a thousand, and so they act on that one right away. But my understanding with my conversation with Christian is he knows if there's, if there's one, there's others. He's going to demand the data from them to make sure that everybody in that class gets the appropriate refunds. I would just add to that. I know we, there are a few restaurateurs that have scheduled to sign up to testify. Uh, you know, they may be able to share their um, direct experience. I will say, and I have not yet been able to get to the bottom of it, but it is interesting if you read some of the news reports where there have been other fees enacted, I believe maybe Portland or elsewhere, where there seems to be a lot of non-compliance, at least in the reporting when it comes to these caps. And for one reason or another, I don't think we've seen that type of widespread non-compliance here in the city of New York. Uh, perhaps it was because of the good work of the council and others on you know, drafting the, reg, the, the law in a, in a stronger way. Um, but generally speaking, when there are big problems in non-compliance, um, we hear about them day in and day out. Like Rob had mentioned before, we continue to hear, why can't I do a surcharge? When are we gonna have a plan to reopen New York dining? What about the taxes? frustration over various different types of inspection. So um, again, while it's not scientific, the fact that we have not heard about widespread non-compliance other than issues here and there uh, leads me to believe that generally uh, there has been um, pretty good compliance. There has been mentioned in one of the comments earlier, uh, perhaps issues about the credit card fee being charged in addition to the five cent, a uh, five cent, five percent fee. Um, but I do hope that that's been sorted out, at least with one or two of those companies that were charging it in that manner. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, you say you have a list of 13 to 14,000. I would imagine that's statewide, not just uh, city. citywide. Uh, just I mean, there may be some people uh, outside of uh, the city in it, but. What, what's the total number of restaurants in the city of New York? Uh, well, there is, oh, well, yeah, so there's more than 25,000. Yep. More than 25,000 so, eating and drinking established. And I'd also note that this is, there could be multiple people um, on the list, on from, one. you know, one established. My point being is that, that just using math, 
that's half of the total establishments in the city of New York and not even taking consideration multiple email addresses for one establishment. Sure. So meaning that we have not reached every uh, establishment out there. Yeah, I can only speak on behalf of the hospitality alliance. And then my question to Mr. Klosner would be based on the uh, three uh, uh, identified complaints from Andrew Riggi of bogus charges. Has your investigation into those charges resulted in a fraction, a violation of the law? Were they founded or unfounded allegations? Um, I, I did touch on this briefly in my testimony. Um, the, the company that is asserting, I, it, I mean, this gets to the drafting of the, of the legislation, um, which speaks to charges for their services. Um, the company that we've engaged with and, and, and attempting to resolve this credit card fee um, reads the statute that the credit card processing fee is not their service, but in fact, the service of a third party, which is the credit card transaction processing company. Um, we have not reached the conclusion. Those talks are ongoing. Uh, we, we are investigating and you know, seeking to understand with very, very specific uh, understanding on how, how these credit card fees are being charged and whether there's any markup. I, I will say that one thing that you know, our office has understood in researching is that when companies um, are using third-party credit card transactions, they do, they do get a discount based on a bulk. And so there does appear to be, and I think it's important that the council know this, that uh, larger companies are actually getting a lower credit card transaction processing fee as a, available because they have more customers. Um, you know, the, the council can, can do with this information what it wishes. I think it's, um, you know, it's an important thing to understand um, as this process continues and, and as calls for long-term attention are, are heard. I want to thank you for that because I, I think some of the prior hearings that we've had, some of our third-party food delivery apps said, no, no, there's no markup. This is direct pass-through. So I'm really interested and concerned uh, to hear more about that. And I'm not saying that's all of them. Uh, some have admitted that they bumped them up just for the administrative end. Uh, but I'm looking forward to hearing the results of your investigation into this end as you negotiate. Thank you. And, sure, and, our, and our view, to, yeah. I was just going to say that our, our view is that, um, you know, even if, even if that credit card fee passed through was exempt, that any additional markup above uh, what they're being charged by the third party um, would constitute a fee under the 5%, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glassman. Thank you, Chair. Joe and I, uh, we will next hear from Josh Gold, followed by Evan Franca and Kathleen Riley. Mr. Gold, you may begin your testimony. Your time starts now. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair Joe and I, council members. Thank you for having me uh, today. Uber Eats welcomes a continued conversation with the council on the topic of food delivery platforms. When I last appeared before the committee in April, many of us held out hope that phase four and dining reopening was possible this summer. Unfortunately, it looks like that may not happen at full capacity for quite a while longer. Let me start by being clear. Restaurants are not only collectively one of the largest employers in the city, they are part of what makes living in New York City great and as such are essential to the city's recovery and continued success. As I'm sure many listening here do, I unfortunately share news of restaurants I love closing almost daily with friends. The city must continue to take steps to ensure that more restaurants survive and can thrive in the future. I believe that one reason we finally saw outdoor dining take the place of some street parking was the work by this body and members of this committee in particular to consistently push the administration to take steps that other cities were taking already. I'm hopeful that the council will continue to call out and reimagine other areas to make owning and operating a restaurant in New York City less difficult in good times and in these difficult times. Like New York City, Uber Eats would be fundamentally different if it would exist at all without a vibrant restaurant community made up of thousands of small and large establishments. And there's no question that unlike many of our city's small restaurants, we have a much greater ability to sustain losses. So I'm not here to oppose this bill, only to ask you to consider a small change. Uber Eats operates two different models in New York City. One model is a two-party marketplace where we connect restaurants to consumers. Those restaurants employ their own delivery personnel or use another survey like Relay to deliver food. 
Earlier this summer, we temporarily dropped the fee for restaurants who only wish to use this type of marketplace from the 5% cap to 0%, and that runs through the end of October. Other restaurants participate in a three-party model where they choose to have Uber Eats facilitate the delivery for them because it means not having to pay up front for a delivery worker by the hour all day to wait for orders to come in. They can choose to pay a bit more on the individual order to have Uber Eats facilitate the delivery only when the order comes in. This offering is more important now than ever because restaurants are cash strapped and many can't afford to pay workers to be on call all day. With Uber Eats, they only have to pay for delivery logistics when an order comes in. While the losses on that first model are real, they are easier to sustain for a long period of time. That's why we've been able to lower the fee to 0% because we are not facilitating the delivery where a worker needs to earn a fair amount as well. Because of the long-term uncertainty, in order to limit the losses on the three-party delivery model, we're asking the council to consider raising the 15% portion of the cap to 17.5%, not right now or next month or even three months from now, but 60 days after restaurants are allowed to open for indoor dining. A small increase on just the delivery portion of the cap would be more sustainable to maintain for a long period of time, given how uncertain 100% capacity is at this time. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Uh, I'm gonna call on Councilmember Powers for questions. Thank you, thanks for the testimony. Um, I just wanna ask a question on that point you just made right here, which is, so you, you have uh, Uber Eats, the, you, uh, um, in this case, has, is not charging for a company to be listed, or I guess do the marketing on your app, but you are currently charging the 15% fee for providing delivery, is that correct? We're not charging the 5% if you only use us for uh, uh, the processing the order the marketing, the listing. Uh, we also are not passing through the credit card charging. So we're, we're taking a loss on the, uh, the processing of credit cards. If you're losing for using us for the facilitating delivery, we are charging the 5% plus the 15% because they're, the losses are much greater on that end. So, you're, so if I uh, own Keith's Pizza in uh, Stives in town, I put my pizza place on your app. I, don't, I have my own delivery people. I'm just, I'm getting no fee for listing. If I utilize Uber Eats' delivery service to be delivering for me, I'm paying the five for listing and the 15 for the actual delivery service. Does that sound correct? That's correct. Okay, gotcha. And the 17 and a half would be that you're asking for, or you're, you're recommending as an amendment for the future, that would be same setup, you would still be charging, would you still be charging zero at the end, under that circumstance? You know, right now the 0% is through the end of October. And, you know, it's something that we did um, both uh, uh, for restaurants, but also, you know, quite frankly, to distinguish ourselves from some of our competition um, and get more people to, to sign up for restaurants to sign up for our service. Um, right now it's running through the end of October. Um, I don't know if that's going to uh, continue in the future. That may go back to the 5% that's required under the cap, um, but we wouldn't go, you know, we're not recommending to go above the 5% because the, again, the losses when you're just providing the, the quote unquote marketing or listing, um, you know, is, is, is much more contained. It has to do with the credit card processing, especially if you aren't passing those through. It's news to me that they can be passed through um, or there, there's some disagreement there. Um, the, the losses are, are, are um, much more limited than if you have to make sure a delivery person has to be uh, uh, compensated as well. Okay, and the 17 and a half percent proposal would be, what? can you just remind me the timeline you're talking about in terms of what that would, when that would be in effect? Yeah, look, I think uh, um, the, the concern we have with the draft here is that 100% in-person capacity may be a very long time away. Um, and we're, we're you know, willing to live with a cap um, I'm told that uh, and face that uncertainty. Um, we are just worried about maintaining um, that on the delivery side where we have to uh, uh, pay the delivery worker um, or have to make sure the delivery worker is paid um, for you know, a, a, an uncertain period going forward. And so the ask would be when indoor dining does start to have a clock run of 60 days. And so maybe you have 50% dining capacity or 25% dining capacity indoor. You have 60 days from that, that start um, to then to then have the step up to 17 and a half percent. That makes okay. sense? Yeah, yeah, I get you. 
Um, and then I'm paying, I'm a restaurant, I'm paying, I don't have, uh, you know, in this, in my hypothetical situation here, uh, Keats Pizza does not have a delivery person. I use Uber Eats. I rely on you to help me to delivery. How much of that money that I pay towards Uber Eats, or I'll ask the other ones too, goes to the actual person making the delivery? I may, I may be the only person in the industry represented about the food, but um, hopefully not. But, um, uh, you know, from our perspective, look, uh, um, you know, it, it depends on the order. If there's a $10 order, all of it's going to go to the delivery worker, and then we're going to have to cover more uh, as well. Um, if it's a larger order, um, because it's percentage-based fee, uh, it may be a, a little bit uh, uh, less. But, um, you know, if you looked at our, our, our earnings that came out on Monday, um, we lost hundreds of millions of dollars in, in the food delivery business. And so more money is going out to the delivery workers than we're kicking in. But, but what is the answer to my question, which is the, what is, how much of that is going to the delivery person? Why well, it depends on, so if it's a $10 order and we're taking a dollar 50, then all of it's going. If it's a hundred dollar order and there's $15, then it depends on, you know, how, how the, the time and distance uh, between uh, uh, the restaurant and where the food is going. So if you're delivering something for five, you're, you're, you're paid as a delivery person, um, part of what factors into your pay is based on how long you're taking to deliver the food. Uh, if it's two miles away and takes you 30 minutes, you're gonna get paid more than if it's uh, you know uh, next door and takes three minutes. So is it is it a formula? It's a formula that I get paid on. I'm an independent contractor, I think in this case. So I'm an independent, I get paid on a formula around how long the order takes to deliver, is that? Correct, and how many delivery people are out there. So oh, okay, okay. There's a, a low supply, which we've seen over the past, uh, uh, there's a low amount of delivery workers out, uh, which we've seen over the past couple of uh, uh, months, um, then uh, there's more, the, the, the pay goes up. And, okay. Uh, um, and uh, what, what, I asked this question earlier, but what, what are other jurisdictions doing? What is Los Angeles doing? I think that came up earlier. Um, what are cities, other major cities, Houston, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, what is the model they're utilizing? Have any picked up our legislation passed it, or what are the other models being used? Yeah, so when, when this first started, uh, I think it was San Francisco went first, uh, it was a straight 15% cap, so they didn't factor in um, if you were uh, facilitating the delivery or if you, you know, if the restaurant was, was taking all that cost on their own and facilitating the delivery. So San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, D.C. went before New York and they all did uh, straight 15%. Um, New York uh, led the way in thinking about this in a more sophisticated way um, and saying, you know, if you're facilitating the delivery, you probably need more revenue coming in than if you're just providing a transaction, an opportunity for transaction. And after New York did that, we saw Santa Monica, LA, Philadelphia, um, and others copy that model. There's still a few like Oakland and, and uh, um, Clark County and Nevada that went with the, the San Francisco model. Um, but even the state of New Jersey, um, it's a little bit higher. It's a, a 10 and 15 rather than a, a five and uh, 15. Um, but the state of New Jersey, or maybe it's a 10 and 10, um, also uh, uh, copied the, the, the New York model. So some are doing like, a, you, here's your fee, whether you're doing delivery, you're doing marketing, whatever it is, here's a straight cap. You can't do more than that. Others are doing a model where it says, based on what service you are selecting or what model you're in. Ours is a five and a 15, I think. So it's like a 20% cap uh, where others are doing, um, others are doing uh, some just hard cap at 15% or something like that. Yeah, that's correct. I think uh, some jurisdictions are recognizing that uh, it is more costly to deliver, to facilitate the delivery than just the process of the transaction and some are not. Okay. Um, okay, I'll leave my questions at that. Thanks for, thanks for uh, the answers and the testimony. Thank you, Councilmember Powers, and I'll turn it back to Chair Jonah for additional questions. Uh, thank you, and great questions, uh, Councilmember. Hey, Josh, uh, we often refer to the relationship that the third-party food delivery apps have with restaurants as a real partnership. Am I correct that one couldn't coexist without the other? Yeah, I did in the testimony today. I think that's a um, you know something that uh, is important. Yes. So then, let me throw something out there. If collectively you have a common interest, why isn't 
the industry working or the third party food delivery apps working with the industry to help have them reopen sooner than later. The resources that these third party food delivery apps have, uh, and I'm talking about the legal teams and the lobbying efforts and the expertise that exists. Why aren't you championing this issue collectively for our small businesses, whether it be at a city level or a state level, saying the sooner we get these restaurants to reopen, the more, uh, the, the, the better percentage they'll be able to survive, the more business that'll come through that door, the more willing uh, we're able to do our part and show our responsibility. Is this a foreign concept or am I out of my mind? No, I think that's uh, something that's worth considering and I'm happy to, to talk to Andrew and, and Robert and others who, who lead those efforts after. Um, we have joined them in lobbying for uh, um, uh, the um, uh, food uh, uh, programs that, uh, so you have in, 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 in uh, uh, for food stamp programs, uh, both California and Illinois allow uh, uh, takeout food, um, restaurant prepared meals. New York is not a state that does that. Um, we've lobbied the state um, because that's an opportunity for restaurants um, to get some more uh, uh, income. Um, so we jointly lobbied the state and the federal government on that. And you know, I think it would be uh, uh, important to hear from them if, if we could be an, uh, add a voice to that conversation, if that's something that uh, they think would be impactful on the state level. It's something that, that uh, we're willing to explore. Well, Josh, on uh, the interactions I've had with all of small business, in particular the restaurant industry, this is what they need, a champion. Take this to uh, the state or the city level and begin the conversation. What will it take? And you should bring in all your other uh, competitors to understand that a real partner and in a real partnership, this is what you do. You fight the battles for your partner. And I'll leave it to you to translate. Thank you, Council Member. I'll, I'll definitely reach out to uh, uh, Andrew and Robert and see where we can be helpful in, in fighting with them to make sure that restaurants survive. Because as you said, we won't exist the same way, if at all, without uh, a, a thriving restaurant industry. And if that's what they need, we need to be there for them. So great. When can we expect a class action lawsuit against the state of New York? <laughs> On answer. And I can't Thank you, Mr. Gold. Uh, we will now hear from Evan Franca, followed by Kathleen Riley, followed by Andrew Ding. Mr. Franca, you may begin your testimony. Your time starts now. Evan, you're having audio issues. Uh, it seems Mr. Frank is having some technical difficulties. We will return to him after the next panelist. So we're just going to move to Kathleen Riley, and then we'll, we'll try to return to Evan Frank afterwards. And then, Mr. Frank, uh, when you do, just interrupt it this way you know we can call on you. Ms. Riley, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kathleen Riley, and I'm the New York City Government Affairs Coordinator for the New York State Restaurant Association. We're a trade group that represents food and beverage establishments in the city and state, and our members represent a large and widely regulated constituency in New York City. Uh, but more importantly, nearly five months to the day since stay-at-home orders were imposed in response to COVID-19, they represent one of the industries hardest hit by this pandemic. For five months, these business operators have been prevented from running their dining rooms. They have been, by and large, still expected to pay rent and other expenses they cannot afford. They've applied for PPP loans, some have gotten them, others have not, and most of the money has run out either way. While outdoor dining has become an opportunity for some, others have not been able to participate, and a summer of regular thunderstorms and one tropical storm has put a damper on the most optimistic goals for the revenue this program could generate. 
We are strong advocates for following the reopening guidelines, and we've taken great pains to educate operators about how to comply. But some restaurants have lost their liquor licenses as a result of customer behavior that is extremely difficult for operators to control on their own. Worst of all, the outlook of the fall and winter is completely uncertain, and many are staring down the real possibility of having to close permanently with no federal compromise on the horizon and no timeline available for when indoor dining can resume. In this atmosphere, we've come today to applaud Council Members Jonai and Moya and the Small Business Committee for introducing and considering these proposals to extend the controls on third-party delivery platforms. To be brief, NYSTRA wholeheartedly supports these proposals and especially the change that would tie fee caps to any limitation on indoor on-premise dining. When the initial fee caps were passed, I don't think anyone predicted that New York City would not be allowed to fully follow the phased opening process that the rest of the state was able to follow. And therefore no one predicted that lasting bans on indoor dining would be a problem for New York City restaurants to confront. While outdoor dining is absolutely an improvement compared to no on-premise dining at all, and we are so appreciative to City Council for making the Open Restaurants program a reality and extending that program into the fall. Granted, some certainty about beyond October 31st would be appreciated. It is also a limited opportunity for so many reasons. Between weather, street features that limit eligible space, narrow storefronts, nightly curfews for outdoor seating, and more, it's safe to say that outdoor dining alone cannot make up for the other enormous losses restaurants have suffered at the hands of COVID-19. As long as indoor dining is limited, restaurants continue to suffer. Takeout and delivery continue to be critical business segments for restaurants hoping to survive. For that reason, it's only right to continue the fee caps on the platforms that facilitate this business segment so long as indoor on-premise dining is limited and for a 90-day transition period thereafter. This is the appropriate indicator to use as a benchmark, especially when we consider the coming autumn and winter months when takeout and delivery will become even more central to business. NYSTRA also supports extending the law punishing food delivery platforms that charge fees for phone calls. Thank you. That never resulted in orders. For this particular proposal, we actually think the business practice in question is inappropriate and exploitative all the time, even beyond the circumstances of COVID-19. If you have our support for this extension, we would even more strongly support making the behavior permanently illegal. Uh, in conclusion, we're so appreciative that you have been monitoring the ongoing situation and the changing circumstances and that you're submitting this appropriate adjustment to the previously passed fee caps. We look forward to being an ongoing partner in this effort with you. And thank you for hearing us today. Thank you, Ms. Riley. Seeing no council member hands raised, we are going to move to Andrew Ding and then followed by Andrew Snippers. Um, again, if Evan Frank, I is able to get his technical systems working, we'll come back to him uh, when he's able to do so. Mr. Ding, you may begin your testimony. And time Hi, starts now. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Ding. I'm the owner of The Expat. We're a bar in Morningside Heights, Uptown. I um, wanted to thank um, Chair Jonai and all council members who've helped pass these bills to help out businesses like my own. Our survival was most definitely due to that intervention. I'm going to echo a lot of what the previous speaker said. Um, <clears throat> in regards to our tour dining, it helped us regain about 20%, 20 to 25% of our pre-COVID revenue. So we really are, are just um, operating in a baseline survival mode and there's no profit to speak of. That revenue has allowed us to rehire two servers back. Um, it's contributed to our ability to pay back a little bit of our um, deferred rents as well as a lot of the utility bills, we put a pause on paying during the past few months. Um, so our biggest concern is about what's going to happen when winter comes and you know, we have to wait until I think it was next May for that outdoor dining component to, to come back. And to echo um, council member Rosenthal's point about prior notice, um, we, as a, as a bar, we actually chose not to build out on the curb simply because of the absolutely cost prohibitive nature of that project. It would have cost us about $12,000 to build that curb out. And knowing that we had only until October 31st, it made no sense. Um, so if we had more prior notice, we could definitely plan more accordingly. Um, so yeah, anything that can happen to, to, to push that kind of notice would be amazing. Um, I definitely want to uh, put my support for the cap on delivery charges. 
I know that that model is possible and can be executed with a fair structure because I know Relay does it very, very elegantly. And you should probably look at how Relay prices their um, business model to get a sense of where they're actually doing it right. And I have a feeling it has to do with the ability for the restaurant to recapture some of that um, cost by keeping some of the delivery fees that they charge the customer. Where I, I, whereas Grubhub um, I don't, doesn't give you that ability to offset that cost. In re relation to the phone order fees, I can confirm that I do in continue to receive these, um, these charges and the error margin, margin of error continues to be around 85%. It definitely has dropped in the past three months since June 2nd, but um, just by a very cursory look, um, I, I got probably 13 orders and also the, the fees associated has dropped. It used to be around six to $7, now it's about $1.70. Um, so really prior to today, having the time to sit here and also look at my screen, I didn't really have the ability or the bandwidth to even look into this. Um, to all, again, echo the previous figure, it should be illegal. There's no reason for it. Their current um, metrics and their current statistical model is clearly um, faulty beyond repair. Um, so it just, should, why, why is this still even happening? Why, why, let's just get rid of it. Anyway, thank you again. Thank you for hearing me out. Um, I look forward to, you know, you continued support. Thank you, Mr. Ding. I'll now turn it to Chair Joe and I for questions. Thank you. Um, Andrew, thank you for your testimony and thank you for your patience. So you're saying you're still receiving charges for erroneous phone charge orders that should not have yielded a charge? Yep, I just did a quick survey while I've been sitting here listening to everyone else's testimony. Um, for the past, the, I think since June, June 2nd, which is when I believe these bills went into effect, I received 13 um, of the charges that were not orders resulting in a dollar sixty charge and two calls that were actually ordered. So I mean this is a great improvement. You know, like we're talking about like under dollars or you know very just pocket change, right? But it's still happening. Well, thank you, Andrew, and I, and I believe Christian is still with us on the phone uh, following this. So OSC, uh, I'm sure, is going to be interested in hearing more from you. Have you brought it to their attention? Actually, you know, I maybe it's because I missed uh, an email from the Restaurant Alliance, but I didn't really know about these, this tip line until today. So I will definitely, like, spend the time to download these recordings, put everything in a drive, and send it <laughs> Um, I've actually worked with Christian previously. He reached out to me um, and I helped him with some um, information about how to determine, like how to read the, the, the statements from Grubhub. Andrew, I, I'm going to ask you to do two things. Uh, yeah. One, contact my office. I'd like to know more about these. And uh, Reggie, my chief of staff, can be reached at 718 oh, cool. Sorry, 718 931 mm -hmm. 1721. And I'm going to also make sure that you know the uh, tip uh, hotline is food service tips at ose.nyc.gov. And that's F O O D S E R V I C E T I P S mm -hmm. at ose.nyc.gov. I really want to see this follow through. Thank you, Andrew. Of course. Oh, last question. Did you receive a uh, small business loan or grant from SBS? Have you applied? Uh, so I applied for the PPP and we got uh, we got a little bit of something. Uh, my business has only been open since June of last year. So the data that we were able to provide for a tax return was only for a few months worth of data. And so that a grant was contingent upon that data. So it was, yeah. Andrew, survive, brother. We're Thank gonna have, you know, we if you survive now, we can talk about prosperity later. And we're here for you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, Mr. Ding. Chairman, I, uh, we're now Chairman, I just uh, I, I heard you call my name, so I, I turned my video back on and unmuted. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Ding, you, you don't need to email the tips line. I've, I've already emailed you. Um, oh. Please send the information directly to my inbox and we will follow up with you on these charges. I, I'm distressed to hear this, but we'll get right on it. Got it. Um, and Chair John, I apologize. I have a staff meeting. I, I'll be gone for a half hour. I'll come back. I think the meeting will still be going on and I'll be sure to watch anything I missed. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Uh, we'll now turn to Evan Franco for testimony. And time starts now. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Just switching over to the iPhone. So if the audio is a little shaky, I apologize. Uh, thank you, Chair Jonai, for inviting me back to speak on behalf of the beleaguered restaurants in our city. Uh, first of all, I'd like to personally thank the council for stepping up and implementing the third party delivery caps back in May. Uh, this legislation has been critical in keeping Brooklyn Crepe alive and my employees working. Uh, over the past three months, I've been able to save approximately $7,500 as a direct result of this program, which for a small operation like mine has allowed us to keep the lights on for now. And while the outdoor dining has been helpful to many businesses, unfortunately, we haven't been able to participate uh, since we're located on a major traffic thoroughfare, Flatbush Avenue, and there's also a fire hydrant directly in front of my business. So um, unfortunately we can't participate in that. Now, while we've been scrambling to pay our bills, our delivery partners have been lining their pockets. Uh, last council meeting, we heard from some delivery companies saying that this fee cap would crush their business models. Well, in fact, Grubhub stock has nearly doubled since the pandemic and they were just acquired for over $7 billion. And DoorDash just acquired Caviar for over $400 million, consolidating more and more power to these companies and giving us fewer options with less competition. Now, keeping third-party fees at current levels for the foreseeable future until we're allowed 100% indoor dining capacity is crucial to the survival of our industry. Although COVID cases have dropped considerably in our city, uh, thanks in part to sacrifices we've made to suspend indoor dining indefinitely, uh, we're still basically operating under emergency orders with no relief in sight. Even after we're allowed 100% capacity to our dining rooms, customers aren't guaranteed to come back in mass and we will continue to have increased off-premises dining. So before the pandemic, off-premises dining was approximately 16% of all meals eaten in this country. Last week, that number was 37%, so well over double. Uh, returning to the previous 30 plus percent commissions is just not going to be possible. Uh, revenue for us may take years to recover to pre-pandemic levels, if it ever does. And even if it does, the previous system was never a sustainable model for us. We need long-term caps if we're going to bring this industry back. I'd like to close with one statistic. Uh, last week, New York restaurants were the worst affected out of any city in the country, uh, operating at 79% less revenue uh, from the previous year, according to Toast uh, point of sale data. And I think that number says it all. Uh, affordable third party fees are the last hope for me and many of my peers. If these companies are able to go back to their old ways, then we're going to see a lot more for rent signs in our neighborhoods. I'm asking the council to not only extend the current caps, but put in place long-term legislation that stands up for small businesses and encourages our entrepreneurs and restaurateurs on this difficult path forward. As Speaker Johnson mentioned, we need drastic intervention if we are to survive. Thank you for your time. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Franca. Seeing no council member hands raised, we'll now move on to our next panelist. Uh, we will next hear from Andrew Schnippers, followed by George Constantino, followed by Maria Diaz. Mr. Schnippers, you may begin your testimony. Before Mr. Schnippers continues, Evan, I just had one question for you. Did you apply for the loan and grant program through SBS? Did you receive anything? Yeah, I did. I actually did receive um, both uh, an EIDL loan as well as, uh, as well as a PPP loan. And, and those have been also very, very helpful. So that, that's also appreciated. Perfect. Thank you, Evan. And continue to fight. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. Schnippers, you may begin. And time starts I, uh, now. Thank, thank you, uh, Chairman um, John I and council members for having me. Uh, happy to be here today to talk about what's going you know, on with deliveries and sort of our business. And we, you know, we, we started the pandemic with four restaurants. It's a family business, my brother and I. We have closed two, one permanently due to an issue with, uh, without being able to resolve an issue with a landlord, which was discussed today. And I do think rent, uh, as a side note, is, is one of the biggest issues we have. We're still having two very lengthy conversations with, the, with two restaurants that we currently have open. The two restaurants that we have open, we never closed. We stayed open throughout the pandemic. I was actually um, touched uh, and I really you know, struck a chord when um, Speaker Johnson mentioned how when grocery shelves were bare, there were restaurants that were open serving the community, feeding people. And it's, you know, it's, it's myself, my brother, my workers willing to come in in the height of the pandemic. We're losing, we were losing money every single day, especially before you passed the original um, uh, delivery cap. We kind of took a look at our numbers when the frontline workers needed to be fed. We looked at that and said, between that and feeding our community and offering our, 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 our employees a paycheck, even if we lost money, no matter what it took, we decided to stay open. And um, you know, now, now going many months into it, after we've been able to um, have the delivery fees reduced, that helped tremendously. I, I noticed, you know, I'm a, I'm a resident in New York City. I live in Manhattan. I noticed many restaurants that tried to stay open and convert to deliveries closed very quickly. And talking to colleagues and friends of mine that were in the business, they realized soon after you know, they, they moved their business into the delivery realm and, and focused primarily on that, that the fees were so high that it became impossible to do it. So I, you know, you're now seeing a lot more restaurants opening up. Part of it's certainly due to the, the wonderful work you guys have done with outdoor dining. Um, and that has helped quite a bit, but I do think deliveries are, are an important part of the business. Our business happens to be a fast casual business. We're not a full service restaurant. We have quite a bit of seating, but the most, most of our business is office workers. Um, and you know, without them coming back, our business is off 85%. We went from doing 25% of our business as delivery to 90% of our business being delivery at you know, 15 to 30% in delivery fees. There's just no way we could possibly you know, stay in business. It is our expectation, I follow the industry very carefully, that deliveries will continue to be a big part of the business in the, in the many months to come as we recover, which I don't even really believe we're, we're there just yet. You're seeing more and more ghost kitchens open up. Uh, there's a large company, Brinker International, which is running um, a wing business out of their uh, Chili's restaurants and expect to do $150 million in virtual, you know, just deliveries this year in, in the first year alone. The, the, the one last point that I saw, I, I think it's critical that we keep the fees tight and keep them where they've been. We will, we will, you will see many more restaurants close if we do not make the cap. And the last thing I just want to point out, something Chairman John and I that came up before regarding the credit card or the processing fees. One thing I don't think I've heard mentioned is that unless I'm mistaken, a lot of the business that we get through Grubhub in particular, but I'm sure some of the other ones are contract business, meaning Goldman Sachs has contracted orders with them. I'm going to be very shocked that Goldman Sachs pays Grubhub with a credit card for their employee fee, for their employee bills, which must equal tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in a month. So if the fees are really meant to be the actual fees that they, that they um, get or they're charged by the credit cards, uh, you know, I'd be shocked if that's really what it is. And I also at 4.7%, which is what I think we're roughly paying when I take a look at it, Boy, they must really negotiate poorly because we pay two percent for you know roughly in credit cards, maybe three percent for Amex, and we're a tiny little restaurant. So just want to put that out there um, in my closing statement, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Schnippers. Seeing no council member hands raised, we will now move on to the next panelist, uh, George Constantino, followed by Maria Diaz, followed by Adam Farbiars. Mr. Constantino, you may begin your testimony. All Time right. starts now. I, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you to New York City Council for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is George Constantino and I own four restaurants. Uh, three of them are full service restaurants in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Bogota Latin Bistro has been open for 16 years. We have 140 seats on the inside. Uh, Miti Miti Modern Mexican has been open for six years. We have 70 seats on the inside and Medusa Greek Taverna, unfortunately just opened up eight months ago and we have about 50 seats inside. 
Before the pandemic hit us, um, as of February 2020, I employed 130 uh, employees in, in Brooklyn. Once the pandemic hit, I had to lay off 100 employees. That was one of the worst uh, days of my life as an entrepreneur. Um, we were able to stay open with takeout and de delivery only with just 30 employees. Uh, because of the cap of the delivery fees and the addition of outdoor diner, we are now up to about 70 employees. Um, it's still not to our original 130. Uh, the third party delivery cap that was passed in May uh, has been very helpful to my business and all businesses. Uh, it's allowed me to keep revenue in my company um, and it's also allowed me to hire more employees back, um, continue paying the same pre-COVID rent to my landlords because I do understand their business also. Um, and, you know, tenants and landlords have a tricky relationship and that's like the last thing that I want to be, you know, messing with. But at the time being, I'm still paying that full rent. Um, I've been able to pay vendors money that I owed, um, that money that I owed them, uh, business insurance, health insurance, and also not to mention business loans, you know, uh, running restaurants in New York city, you do need loans. And, you know, something that's not discussed is outstanding loan debt that's out there that I need this revenue. Um, so continuing to pay the 15 to 30% that was originally charged uh, in fees by Grubhub, Seamless, Uber, DoorDash, and Caviar really is not sustainable to any business, let alone restaurants, and will quickly result in more restaurants closing down. Uh, the third party caps needs to be extended till the pandemic is officially over and, and indoor dining goes back to 100%. Um, I would even urge that this becomes the new norm and this becomes a permanent cap to help all restaurants. Um, when more revenue stays in New York City restaurants, um, that money is actually used to boom the local economy. You know, I don't think that these other apps really are booming the local economy as much as the local restaurants are. And, and that's by hiring more employees back and even, um, you know, paying vendors, the local vendors. Um, I can tell you, um, you know, with this cap, you know, with my three restaurants, you know, we probably provide, I'll use at least Grubhub, 30000 a week in revenue just to Grubhub. So this cap has allowed, um, you know, my fees would have normally been about 6000 and change. Oh, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll wrap up. My fees would have normally been around 6000 and change, and that's been reduced to around 1500 and change. Um, just like the other gentleman mentioned, Andrew, you know, I was looking on this call. Um, and, you know, I do still see some phone um, charges happening. And, you know, I noticed there's no recording like there usually is, um, you know, but that's something I definitely want to look into more. Um, another thing I think that's not being discussed, you know, yes, there's the, the fee cap, there's bogus charges, but what other, and I don't know if the council knows this, but there are just random refunds that are issued. So let's say like a customer, maybe their food arrived five, 10 minutes late, they'll call Grubhub and complain and Grubhub will issue a refund to that customer, but not let the restaurant know. And the next day when we get our daily summaries, we'll see refund of like $150. And I'll ask my manager, my team, hey, what happened? I thought we had a flawless service. And then it turns out that Grubhub um, and other third-party apps just to appease their customers will issue these refunds but not run it by the restaurant. The restaurant owner has to be on top of the refunds and call and challenge them. And if you actually call and challenge them, then they give you the money back. But that's like another step that you have to do. Um, George, you know, yes, it's, it's Councilman Joan. I, uh, please elaborate here. Is that when you're doing deliveries? That, so I have my own delivery guys, so I'm paying the 5% fee for my restaurants. So what happens is when, let's say a customer's upset, maybe they didn't get a rice or their meal was an extra 10 minutes late, they call to complain to Grubhub and Grubhub issues them a refund without letting us know till the next day when we get a summary of our, of our sales for the previous day. And at that point, we have to call up. It used to be within 24 hours, but they have since expanded that to seven days. We have to call up to say, hey, why is there an $80 refund here? We had no issues last night. And they'll say, oh, really? Okay, we'll give you that money back. So it's like another step that's put in there. And, so you know, you're, you're, I, but, but, and this only happens, and I'm not, you say in all your restaurants, you do your own, your own delivery. You're not using... Yeah. Uh, oh, no, it ha actually it happens. So two of my three restaurants in Brooklyn, I use my own delivery drivers. One restaurant I use, like, the third party delivery drivers. It happens on all of them. I think basically 
these third party delivery apps don't want to spend the time to call the restaurant owner or the manager to say, hey, what happened here? This customer's complaining. They just automatically issue them a refund or a credit that may not be correct. So then it's up to the restaurant owner to then go back and say, hey, why was there a refund? A lot of times if we have our, if we are using Uber Eats or, or Grubhub's delivery drivers, their delivery drivers may take an hour, hour 15 to pick up something. So therefore that's why the food is arriving cold. So, you know, it's just a lot of issues. That's just something on top of the caps and, um, you know, the bogus phone fees that are there. George, I want to talk more about this with you. I'm going to give yep. you my phone number as well, please. Sure. I'm, more, I, I'm concerned with how this is being applied. 718. Yes. 931. Okay. 1721. 1721. Great. And you're saying, because I want to make sure that we get this on the record. Mm -hmm. You are also believing that you're receiving erroneous orders, uh, charges for orders that never took place, whether they be phone or... Correct. Uh, so before the cap happened, I, I would say I had about, you know, five to 10 phone orders a week. And I noticed when I would listen to them, it was my voice on my phone system. You know, when a restaurant, we had a fancy phone system, you know, press one for directions, press one for hours, press three for catering. And I realized since most of these phone calls were my voice and my answering system, I decided to cut that out. So it calls the restaurant directly. I've noticed those uh, phone charges have dropped, but they're still there and they're not legit. You know, there's no George, attached you, to it. No. You heard OSC on the I did. about that. I really want to know more about this. And you're going to let me know. And you're going to put that. Did you get the um, tips uh, uh, email address? I do. Yeah, email? I've actually spoken with Christian in the past before. So um, I need to bring this to your attention. And we have to make sure yeah. that we address it. And as I asked the other uh, individuals, did you receive, and we have to clarify, between the SBA loan and SBS loans and grants? I, I have only applied for PPP, which was an SBA okay. loan. I did not apply for SBS. Yes. You know. Good. Thank I, you, George. Survive. Okay, you. Survive, my dear friend. Survive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Jonai and Mr. Constantino. Uh, we'll next hear from Maria Diaz, followed by Adam Farbiars. Ms. Diaz, you may begin your testimony. And time starts now. Thank you. My name is Maria Diaz. I'm speaking in my capacity as executive director of the Greenwich Village Chelsea Chamber of Commerce. Our organization has been representing hundreds of businesses in lower Manhattan for over 70 years. Chambers of Commerce like ours are one of the first levels of support the local community receives. The pandemic has hit New York City small businesses especially hard. At every sector of life, the city continues to come closer to the new normal. We cannot forget that for many restaurants who have lost months of revenue or even been forced to shut down entirely, the economy they face today continues to be incredibly challenging. With restaurants still unable to fully open the bills in front of the committee of small businesses, which would extend limitations on delivery fees, publish grants given to businesses and eliminate charges to restaurants for calls that do not result in orders are incredibly needed. Through, though New York City is now in stage four and many industries are open, our, our restaurants are still unable to have indoor seating and are incredibly limited in the revenue they can make. Though the open restaurants program has allowed more than 8,000 restaurants to open, New York City is home to more than 25,000 restaurants, meaning for a vast majority, outdoor seating is still not an option. For these restaurants and even for those who have outdoor capacity, they rely on deliveries. When businesses are charged exorbitant fees for deliveries, it makes one of their few means of doing business unprofitable. Similarly, when our restaurants are charged for phone calls that don't result in deliveries, their means of income are once again limited. Without this proposed legislation, restaurants receiving calls that do not result in orders will continue to lose money. Additionally, the publishing of listing the list of businesses that receive grants from SBS will continue to ensure that the city is moving towards having a more equitable playing field for our city's businesses. In these turbulent times, our businesses deserve and need transparency and more clear understanding of where SBS grants are going. With so few ways to make revenue compared to the months prior to the pandemic, we, can, we call on the committee to listen to our restaurants and businesses and help them in whatever way possible. Even while on this call today, um, we received notice that three of our businesses have closed um, on just one street or will be closed by the end of the month, one of them being um, a bar. Beyond just these bills, we call on the committee to pass citywide rent relief that works with businesses and landlords to keep New York City businesses in place. From speaking with our business members, we know that paying rent is a huge concern for many businesses who are already struggling to stay afloat. 
Though we know the eviction moratorium due to expire soon as a state Senate bill, we are asking council to consider New York City specific legislation in order to help stop the growing number of vacancies in the city. While we are hopeful for these bills, we believe that limiting third party delivery fees and limiting charges, um, et cetera, and publishing grants are actions that must become permanent laws. Even prior, prior to COVID-19, restaurants have struggled to make money with the high delivery fees they face. In this time and in the future, we must support our businesses in more ways um, than have been proposed already. Um, other potential recommendations have been to for the committee to consider easing regulations on liquid mines. Thank you. And um, what has been mentioned before is to allow restaurants to receive um, SNAP benefits for um, uh, restaurant goers. Thank you for your consideration and allowing me to testify in this crucial matter. And we hope to work with you to um, ease all this burden our, on our small businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Seeing no council member hands raised, we'll now turn to Adam Farbiars for his testimony. Uh, as a reminder, if you are a member of the public and you wish to testify still, please raise your hand. Ms. Farbiars, you may begin. The time right, starts you. now. Thank you to the council. Thank you to the chair. Um, my name is Adam Farbiage. I founded uh, last year with uh, two of my fellow New Yorkers uh, a business called Deliver Zero. Um, we saw that there was a problem in the restaurant space, particularly in takeout and delivery space, with all of the waste um, that was generated when you make a delivery order. We had an idea, uh, an idea that was unique in the city and in the country, and frankly, in the world that we would outfit restaurants, we would work with restaurants to give them reusable packaging for their restaurant, for their delivery orders. Um, the packaging looks like this, if you can see me on camera, this is very, very sturdy uh, uh, takeout where that a restaurant can package its, its, its takeout orders in. This is stuff that goes in a commercial dishwasher um, and it's very strong and it's just like a dish. Um, we currently work with 27 restaurants, primarily in Brooklyn, a little bit in Manhattan, and we're growing. We give our restaurant partners this um, uh, food service where this reusable takeout stuff for free. We publish the restaurant's menus on our website, just like Grubhub and Uber Eats and all those other companies. And customers order from those websites uh, the restaurant food, just like they would order uh, from Grubhub or Uber Eats or Caviar or whatever. The twist is the restaurant delivers the food in this reusable packaging, in this reusable food service ware. So this is not wasted. This, this gets reused, not recycled, reused, like a dish. Um, again, like I said, the, 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 the packaging is for free. We give it to the restaurants for free. They stock it in their kitchen. We take a commission. Our commission is typically 10% of, of, the, of the food sale, plus we pass on the credit card fee. Or I, I should say that's what we did before Local Law 52, before the coronavirus legislation, which I commend, which I think is wonderful legislation. Um, but I think we have been um, a casualty uh, you know, of that law. Um, like I said, we're extremely small. We have 27 restaurants. It'll be 30 maybe in a couple of weeks. We're very, very small. I was looking at an order that I got a couple of days ago. It was a $17 order with a $3 tip, uh, $1.50 in tax for an Indian restaurant in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Before coronavirus, I would have made $1.70 off that order and I would have passed on the credit card fee to the restaurant operator. Under local law 52, I make 85 cents. That's my five cents of the $17 food subtotal. Plus I eat the credit card fee, which is about 93, 94 cents. So I lost eight cents on the order, which is not a huge loss. I, I, I can stomach a little bit of that pain. It hurts to lose money in the order. But I'm also not only investing in the technology, I give my restaurants tablets for free to take the orders, I have server costs. This stuff is extremely expensive. So my technology tracks this stuff, but the restaurant used four of my boxes to fill that order that I lost eight cents on. Those four boxes cost $25. So I want this experiment, this Deliver Zero experiment, to grow and solve a tremendous problem that we have in the city with waste. But it's very hard for me to sustain this business if not only do I really can't make any money, um, but the, the huge investment that I make in this reusable stuff, which is basically, about, it cost me about three and a half dollars each of these units. And the restaurants can use it however they see fit. But under the law as written, I'm a food 
uh, food delivery app or whatever the law says, a, a, a food delivery service. I'm not really a food delivery service. I'm providing the restaurants with this incredibly expensive hardware for free that they can use and I track it for them. So what I would ask the council is, you know, there, it's, the law as applied to me has a couple of problems. First of all, it's not equitable, it's not fair. I'm not just like Grubhub that gives a bunch of technology and says, here's an order. I'm actually supplying them with this extremely valuable stuff. This is NSF certified restaurant equipment um, that they couldn't do themselves, right? All the restaurants in the network share this stuff. So it's, it's not, it, it, the law is, is a tremendous burden on me as a small business. Second of all, unlike the other, the six big ones, Caviar, DoorDash, Uber Eats, I have no market power. If one of these restaurants says, I'm done with Deliver Zero, I don't wanna work with you. It doesn't matter to them. They're still gonna do deliveries. Unlike Uber Eats, unlike Grubhub, I can't say deal with me or you're screwed, right? The restaurants can easily not deal with me. In fact, most restaurants don't, don't deal with me. I only have 27 restaurants. So I would ask that when local law 52 is, 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 is passed again or the, 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 the time limit is extended on the cap, ideally I would say that it doesn't apply to a food delivery service, which is what I am technically, that provides its restaurant partners with reusable containers, which is what I do. Or if that's too complicated, I ask that it, it, you know, there's a limit of maybe, I, as drafted it says, if, if, if a company like mine has 20 restaurants, I'm stuck with the legislation. If we could bump that to say 200 restaurants, so I could actually grow and grow this business even this joint, during this terrible time, that would be extremely beneficial to my business and frankly to the city, because this solution of, of having reuse saved my restaurant partners money on packaging. It saves them on, on, on uh, commissions. Com my commissions are lower than my competitors. So during this period, I, I would love it if the legislation recognized that not all of these delivery services are like the big six. There's, there, there's at least one weird one like me that provides a different kind of service that unfortunately got swept up in this legislation that frankly I need, I need relief from so I, can, so I can grow my business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. But I, I just want to point out, the, you're charging 10%. This law allows you to charge up to 15% for delivery. No, so, so that's true. The, the 27 restaurants I work with right now, I do not provide courier services to. So I can only charge the 5%. Okay. So in, in my example, I can only, I can only charge you know, the $17 I'm only, food, I got I'm it. only charging 85 cents. So Adam, you're trying to build a better mousetrap and it sounds like you're onto something and... Um... We'll see where it goes from there, but uh, thank you for your testimony, Adam. Thank you. At this time, if your name has not been called and you still wish to testify, please raise your hand. Seeing no additional members of the public wishing to testify, I'll turn it back to Chair Jonai for closing remarks. I wanna thank all of you for your patience and your testimony. And certainly we're going to take everything into consideration um, as we move forward. Uh, we have a lot of work to do and um, I, I keep all of you in my prayers and my thoughts uh, from a health uh, perspective to a business uh, that is uh, being, that is an industry that is under attack. I'm gonna do whatever I can uh, to make sure that we give you all a chance to survive. I'm not here to pick winners and losers. Uh, and my objective is to make sure that every business in New York City reopens. And that's gonna require a partnership uh, at all levels of government, uh, city, state, and federal. And I look at myself first and what I can do, I'll be working closely with the commissioner, which I'm very fond of, and OSC to make sure that uh, our current laws are followed and adhered to. Um, with that, thank you folks. Uh, this will conclude our hearing and we're grateful